Wolf, good to see you. Right on. Luke's story. Dude, so listeners, uh, David walks in, of course. Uh, I don't even know if we made it into the house. And he's like, check this out, check this out. And he busts open these vanilla beans that he grew himself in Hawaii. And there's not only a world shortage on vanilla right now, but there's a shortage just in my life for a long time. And so I'm having a hard time starting the episode because I'm chewing on one of these things. So what's the deal with your magical vanilla? So vanilla, we... 13 years ago, innovated the entire permaculture concept of growing cacao and vanilla together. As strange as that sounds, that, had, that technology and technique had been lost. Um, years later, I found in Mayan iconography of cacao trees that really the iconography, because I've been growing cacao and vanilla together for w well over a decade now, um, there's a certain pattern that you see and patterns that you see when cacao and vanilla are, are grown together. Oh, there we go. Um, and and it's, a, it's a pattern that only a vanilla and cacao grower would see. And I'm looking at Mayan iconography and I see that the cacao trees that are being represented are not just cacao trees, they're cacao and vanilla growing together. And I put that on my Instagram a number of months ago, maybe even a year ago, just to show people that like what they're really representing sometimes in iconography is what we're told. And in this case, it's cacao and vanilla together. They're not, it's the, that's how you're supposed to do it. That's the deal. The vanilla will flower kind of right at eye level and in... All regions outside of Veracruz, Mexico, in that area where the melipona bee, the stingless bee of Mexico, is found, which pollinates vanilla in all areas outside of that. Yeah, it's the best bee ever. What I love that bee. So you can go hang out in a hive of them and they don't have the ability to sting you? Yeah, you just you can touch them and stick uh, your finger no in the hive. And they've got a, such a gentle nature. If you go to Tulum, you'll see them. They're oh, all cool. around there. And that region is the only place where vanilla is pollinated naturally. Outside of that region, vanilla has to be pollinated by human hands. Wow. Every now and then, you know, an ant pollinates it luckily, but it's right. very rare. Right. And you have, to, you have to just get out there every morning. It's only in the morning, and there's only a window of time. So, like, from 7 to 11 in the morning, that's it. If you don't get it then, you, you missed it. Wow. Yeah. And so you just have these for personal use to share with friends and family. You just that's fly right. around the world with them. I was thinking maybe I'll put, you know, I don't know, I'll put 20 of them up on the internet for like 20 bucks each. There's well, there's, a, I mean, dude, there's a shortage right now, though. Like the sites, I usually get mine on um, uh, the beans on Bulletproof. They have like a powdered bean, you know, yep. on Bulletproof.com, and it's just been out of stock forever. I'm like, what the hell? It, the Tahitian powder bean? Yeah. I know, I know that guy. He's awesome. He's an awesome guy. Oh, really? Yeah. We're old friends from the old trade show days oh, back okay. in the day. And uh, I, yeah, I just, I got into growing my own beans, so I never even buy vanilla ever. Right. So, you know, once you have your own and you, you see what it is and how powerful it is and how powerful vanilloids are, that's a whole conversation right there on the vanilloids. Like capsicin is a vanilloid. Mescaline is a vanilloid, right? So there's a whole group of phenethylamine compounds that are psychoactive that are in the vanilloid group. And of course, vanillin is a vanilloid. Wow, trip out. Is and that, they, is that yeah. why I feel so happy all of a sudden? Yeah, that is why. <laughs> I mean, it's good to see you, you know? It's been a while, but uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty lit. Nice. That's awesome. So let's uh, start out. I want to just talk a little bit about the Longevity Now conference because, you know, you're out here. That's coming up um, April 6th, 7th, and 8th in Anaheim. I've been going to that thing for probably 10 years, and I'm always encouraging everyone to go. Um, I, I've been telling the listeners about it. It's on my website. I'm going to be doing some podcasting over there and nice. uh, and going back in a you know a, a more legitimate capacity because last year I just grabbed random vendors and stuff and took them up to my room. It was like, hey, want to be on my podcast? Or maybe that no, that was two years ago because you guys skipped a year. So it's been part of my life for a long time. But for people that don't know about it, like what is the Longevity Now conference? The Longevity Now conference is the summation of all the amazing foods, superfoods, super herbs, healing technologies that we're into with the thought leaders in their fields all getting together for a powwow. And yes, there is information that's presented from the stage, and yes, there's great vendors there, but ultimately the great benefit of the Longevity Conference is being around like-minded people, people who want to innovate health, who want to move the whole ball forward and get us to where we should be. We, we, are, we are lagging behind, and we're basically stuck in a, in a losing situation with big pharma and iatrogenic disease, which is doctor caused or pharmaceutical caused or hospital created disease. And we're just stuck in an old model because the system is entrenched in that old model. And it's kind of hard to move that bureaucracy forward. But instead of us trying to move that bureaucracy forward, it was like, let them deal with it, what they're dealing with. Let's just move the thing ahead ourselves. Right, and how long have you been doing that? 
a long time. I think we started, at, it's been a 12 years, 13 years, something like that, yeah. that we've been doing these conferences. And this is probably going to be my last one, maybe ever or for a while. We'll do a women's wellness conference in the, in the autumn and then I'll take a long break from, and I'll do more, d things that are different. I mean, what people want from me now, they're like, how do you do your social media? Right. Right? Like I was going to ask you about that right? too, dude, honestly. <laughs> right? It's astonishing. So yeah. it's like, you know, I've been in the health field for 25 years. Yeah. It's like, and I can tell you everything you want to know about Pearl and, and you want to know about, you know, the amazing beauty secrets of Chinese medicine, whatever, Longan or Shizandra or whatever. I could go on for that, you know, as you know, for yeah. hours and hours. Yeah. But I could also go on for hours and hours about social media yeah. and what I've learned over the years. Well, it's, it's interesting because as I've heard you talk, I mean, literally, I can't even count the times I've learned so much from you. Um, I've heard you allude to your early days of, you know, uh, uh, Tony Robbins and, um, you know, Napoleon Hill and... Uh, Maxwell Maltz, you know, all of those dudes, Zig Ziglar. I've heard you reference that whole crew, which is all about sales and marketing for the most part, at least Tony's, you know, older work was. So was that kind of the first thing you got into was the entrepreneurial marketing sales vibes before you got into this industry? Well, I'd say it was even more, it wasn't really so much about sales and marketing. It was more just like personal development. Ah, gotcha. It, so I, later as I got into that world deeply, then I was like, oh, okay, there's like sales training stuff in here. And, right. But I, I really got into it because in, in 1984, my mom sent me to super camp. That sounds and, dope. What was that? It was a cool camp, still going. And it's it was like an accelerated learning, very um, intense, like seminar style camp. Oh, cool. You know, where you go, like, I was a 14-year-old kid, or maybe I was 13, yeah, because it, was, it wasn't even my 14th birthday yet. 13 years old, went to this camp up in Bear Valley, California, and just learned all the great things about speed reading, hyper learning, um, being able to, to memorize lists quickly, the Scott Bornstein method of using visualizations to remember numbers or to connect numbers to images or, you know, it's just really clever stuff. But I met Tony Robbins there oh, in 1984, wow. and we spent a day with him, and that's what got me started into it. Interesting. That's what got me started into it. I still have that notebook from that, really? from that camp, yep, and so, I still reference and it. And you were like 14 when you oh, went there? I was, yeah, I was 13, actually, now that I think and about it. And this was, it doesn't sound like it was a school, like a disciplinary school where you get sent because you're a screw-up kid. It's like more for... Well, it felt like that when, I, when my mom was like, you're going to this oh, camp. Okay. I was like, I'm not going to that camp. I'm hanging out with my friends. We're, we're going surfing. Forget, this is a nightmare. Right. But then I somehow got, got pushed into it, so I did it, and it was a life, thank God. You yeah, know, life-changing things that's set, cool. set my course in my life differently. I asked because I got sent to this sort of cult, really strange school called Rocky Mountain Academy, which was the sister school of a school called SIDU in San Bernardino. And uh, this was, you know, 1983, 84. But it was for kids that were really screwed up, you know. But they did a lot of really bizarre experimental and experiential therapies and things like that. So a little bit along those lines, but I think it was like not as positive you know it's kind of hardcore but what a cool thing so you got to meet uh tony robbins then when you were really young I mean, yeah old, he wasn't that much older than you. he's then, 10 right? years older than me 10 years oh, yeah okay. so he was like 23 or 24 and we had you know we did zip lining and ropes courses and all that kind of stuff right you know, that you do at yeah. that kind of that, that kind of event and then that got me started and then eventually i found napoleon hill stuff and, and step by step got into personal development research and literature and step by step, it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is how you actually like, can get your message out there. But I didn't know what that message was until I was about 23. And then it all came together. I was like, oh, this is it. This right. is the message I have for the world. And this is what I can put all of that energy behind. And, where, that was, is that, and that's nutrition and, and yeah. healing and health. Is that where you, where did you hone your skills in terms of public presenting and being an orator or just speaking and engaging an audience like you do? Well, I think I've st always had it. You know, so yeah. ever, ever since I was a kid, every football team I was on, every baseball team at the end of the season, they're like, you give the speech to the, to the coach. You're right. the one who gives the speech at the dinner, right? They would just somehow, they'd always pick me, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I right. always had a knack for public speaking and a love of it and the art of it. And then I went out there, once I knew what my message was and what I wanted to do with my life, I went out there and I put feet to pavement and just went for it and, and just worked all the stores, all the health food stores, the yoga centers in Southern California, all the, all the um, bookstores, started to develop the whole category of raw food nutrition, 
then started to, to develop the category of superfoods. Step by step, the internet came in and then we developed the first raw food website, the first superfood websites, the first informational sites for that kind of innovation. And then that eventually took me to the far corners of the earth. And now I've been doing that for, you know, I've done 3,000 events 25 years later. I have so much public speaking experience for my age. It's insane. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I need to take a break, actually. <laughs> yeah. it's like, well, that's funny because I was going to ask you, uh, you know, having been to the Longevity Now conference for all of these years, I mean, I don't think I've missed many of them. And there you are, like, every year just doing your thing. And I, I've often wondered, like, when's this gig going to kind of get old, you know? Not, not in the sense that, you know, it's inauthentic or something like that, but I know doing my fashion school after eight, nine years, another class was just like cool, this is just my gig today, but I didn't have the passion, the passion behind it. Yeah. I still have the passion behind nutrition for sure, and yeah. I absolutely love it. But I also have passion for other things, right. and, that's, and I have passion for social media. I have right. a passion for being part of a team, and I love my, my team a, a lot, the current team I've got, and we're having so much fun together, and we can really do amazing things. And I have a passion for, as Jim Rohn taught me, and Jim Rohn taught me this back in 19, I think in 1995 when we met. He, he told me, you need to develop your own personal philosophy. And I've always had a passion for that, but I kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. And then eventually, all that came together when I was really able to crack the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's what it that's all That's a came random together. correlation there. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner is our guiding light. And Rudolf Steiner is the guiding light. He's like our Aristotle. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and eventually people will realize that as time goes on. I mean, we know that because we, you know, we love biodynamic farming. This yeah. is certified biodynamic vanilla, by oh, the way. Oh, no way. Really? You are eating certified biodynamic Rudolf Steiner vanilla. Wow. Only in the world. Wow. Yeah. That's, dude, no wonder it's so potent. <laughs> that's, that's funny because I, you know, some of that work, like Victor Schauberger and, 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 uh, and, and, and him, I, it's a little hard for me to grasp some of it. Like, I get the common sense just sort of natural laws of the universe alignment like okay that's kind of a no-brainer but then it gets so deep and vortex that it's like difficult for me to grasp it so for someone that's never heard of Rudolf Steiner what would you say like the core you know main principles of his teachings are good one okay well when it comes to farming what you're doing with farming is you're mixing the stuff of the earth with the stuff of the heavens in a unique way that's Rudolf Steiner's farming in a nutshell um, what does that look like? Well, for example, like I live in the jungle in Hawaii, so I will go to the beach and I'll mix up crushed up lobster shells and sand and coral, and I will bring that up to my farm. And you know, we're in a clay pit, and I'll mix that in with our clay, and that will be mixed in with the local horse manure and then the coconut material. And then th- those things have been treated in a certain way. For example, I may have um, let. Um, I'll take salt water, for example, sea salt water, and I'll put bromeliads in there until they rot, or aerial plants until they rot. And then that's the, you know, the stuff, the aerial plants, the plants that don't really need soil, and then seawater and mixing that with, the, with soil, right? I'll take all different kinds of things like that and make experiments, and then eventually that will turn into epic quality food because I've uniquely mixed the stuff of the heavens with the stuff of the earth. Right? I'll do interesting things with rainwater. We catch rainwater off the roof, and then I'll take the rainwater and I'll treat it with effective microorganism, for example. And then I'll do experiments on one half of the house that all gets that water. And then we'll see what happens. See, you know, if we can notice, okay, what's happening here that's different? And we've noticed a few things that are different from doing that's those kind cool. of experiments. So that's, that's ultimately what biodynamic farming is about. It's not specific to biodynamic farming. There right. is a very specific biodynamic, biodynamic farming protocol how you make 501, 502, 503, 504, 505, all the way to 509. Is that the mixture that you... Those are the mixtures. Like, for example, you take a lactating cow's manure, you know, if you want to know 501, you take a lactating cow's manure and you will basically take a, almost like a spatula and and put it into a horn. So then it goes into a horn. You get, say, 100 horns like that or 200 horns like that. Then you're going to bury that in the earth over the winter. Now what that's doing, like according to Rudolf Steiner and just according to our own sensibilities, a cow is very telluric. It's, it's on the earth. It's heavy on the earth. A deer is completely opposite. A deer is flight of foot. 
a deer has these antlers like antenna that's connected to the astral forces. It's, it's like antennas that connect to the stars. And the what Rudolf Steiner says is that the deer concentrates those astral forces, the forces of the stars and the heavens, in its bladder. That comes up in another biodynamic preparation. But the telluric forces are concentrated by the cow and its horns, and especially a lactating cow in its manure. You will then dig that up in the springtime, and you'll shovel the material out, and you'll have increases of manganese by 15 times, magnesium 20 times, zinc 15 times, stuff that violates all theories of reality. Oh, wow, dear. Right, yeah, and that, that's, anybody can reference that if you really wanna get a good book that's approachable. Burden Tompkins, who wrote Secret Life of Plants, also wrote a great book called Secret Life of the Soil. Oh, cool. And that's a, an approachable way to look at Rudolf Steiner and biodynamic farming. Right. Then you take that material, okay, now you've gotten out of the horns. You take that material, you put it in a big vat of spring water. And then you're gonna you're gonna turn it. Let's say you're gonna go clockwise, and as you go clockwise, you go down and sound like, and you go down, and then you do that for a minute, and then you go counterclockwise, and you sing into the water and go up in sound, going counterclockwise. You do that for an hour, so you do 30 one way, 30 the other way. So 30 minutes, you know, one minute, then another minute, then another minute. Each you flip it around, so you're basically vortexing one way, then stop, then vortex it the other way with the sound. So you have a little bit of that material in there that you took from, say, one horn or two horns, right. and you're potentizing it. Then you're going to take that barrel of material, say a 55-gallon drum, and you're going to go around at, dos at dusk and dawn, and you're going to take a paintbrush, and you're going to flick it on all your trees or all over your vegetables. And then what you're doing is you're concentrating the telluric forces into your fruits and vegetables, for example, like if you have an orchard. And that's one preparation. Dude, that's nuts. That's nuts. And you're doing this stuff in Hawaii? We do that stuff in Hawaii. And how the hell did he come up with the, the, this, this formula or, or a series of formula? There's, there's something you know, so important for all of us, and that is so, there are people in this world who are seers and prophets, and they just have information. They're tuned into psychic and spiritual information that's not available to everyone else. And Rudolf Steiner was such a person. Right. And all you have to do is take his material and, and see if it works for you. And, and you'll see that, like, geez, how did he know this? And then if you re after, after 20 years of investigating Rudolf Steiner personally, I, and I, with the intent of, like, how would Rudolf Steiner think about this? How do I inculcate into myself those feelings that would allow me to pick up on this intuitively? Right. Now I get it. I really get it. And I get what we're up against. And I, and I, and I know that. The key teaching of Rudolf Steiner, which we haven't gotten to yet, is really one of the most important teachings of all for everybody to understand what's happening in our world. And that's this idea that, you know, we're always trying to be in the middle between two competing parasitic forces that will eventually plunge us into doom. And one of those is the, the force that wants to disintegrate. So there's parasites in nature that will disintegrate you, but there's also thought forms that can disintegrate you, like addiction, right? Where you, somebody gets addicted to drugs and, I know that one. They, and it's escapism. Yeah. That's one side. He called that the Luciferic force. On the other side, <laughs> Damn, dude. it's full on, right? <laughs> and then on the other side is the Aramonic force, which is the one that wants to sedimentize you and basically turn you into a rock, where that's like arthritis and right. the, the um, plaque formation in our cardiovascular system is related to thoughts, forms, and ideas and belief systems that believe that this material world is all that is, which is very, very dominant in our culture today. You know, in our right. world, our little niche, right. we don't really believe that, don't, like, you know, we know there's more. Yeah. I mean, we know that there's, that the power of faith works, and we know that the power of goal setting activates forces in the universe that come to our aid. But not everybody knows that. Most people don't. Yeah, and, that's and, like that stuff you're always talking about, the scientism. And, and that's scientism. Yeah, yeah. Ar Ar scientism. yeah. like he, he, uh, Rudolf Steiner called it the aramonic deception. He's basically telling us that we've been deceived and that we thought science was giving us all the data. But in fact, it wasn't. It was an, there's an agenda. So some of the data has been left out because, well, whoa, that, that went against our findings. We got to get rid of that. Yeah, and, and I, it seems to be that that's true across so many different areas of knowledge and human civilization where the elites or the powers sort of at the top of the pyramid have information that the general populace doesn't. Like we were just talking about Kundalini Yoga. My friend Elliot led me through a little set before you came and the guy that brought it here, Yogi Bhajan, said, you know, I, I, they put a death, uh, you know, a death curse on me if I came here and taught this to 
non-Brahmin or whatever, you know, Westerners or whatever. And he was, you know, he just decided I don't care and he did it and, you know, he lived for quite a while. So maybe the curse was weak sauce. But uh, point being, it, there's really powerful energy that certain people have learned how to, uh, to harness and use for good and for evil, but it's, it's like secret information. And I love uncovering that kind of stuff. That, that's what you'll find. I mean, Rudolf Steiner ultimately, it's, it's kind of like a um, Game of Thrones concept, if you're familiar with that. I have not watched it yet. I, I've never seen an episode, but I'm familiar yeah. with the books. Okay, okay. And there's a subtext in that show and in those books of the, all the uh, magicians that are like the, they're the court kind of counselors are all secretly working together to overthrow magic and replace it with science. Oh, no way. How true to life. I right? wonder where they got that theme. Right? So that's, that's, that's part of the genius that it's a subtext that I think people feel intuitively something is there. And that's the thing that Rudolf Steiner was really onto. He's, what he's really giving us, I mean, what's, you know, lactating cow on a horn buried through the winter. And, you know, what is that? It's magic. Right. It's a form of magic. Right. So he, what he's detailing in his books is his form of magic. There are other forms. And there's forms of good magic and there are forms of dark magic. And so... We're just learning all about that now because we've broken through with the internet and all this communication. It's like, geez, I could grow a different farm in a different way. I could have a certified or organic farm, yes, but I could have a certified biodynamic farm also and see if I can take it up another level or even go beyond what Rudolf Steiner taught us and see if there's a better way to even do it better. Right. And that's, that's working on your own magic. Right? right. So if someone goes out and buys some biodynamic wine or some other product, are they following one of those 501, 502? Are they going to be Absolutely. like certif certification means that you followed one of those protocols? All of them. Oh, no way. Yes. That's madness, yeah. dude. It's, God, it's, 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 it's crazy. It sounds like such work. Um, a friend of mine here uh, has a company called Zen Bunny. I don't know if you've had this I, chocolate. I know Zen Bunny. Yeah. Absolutely. So Zen, he, he's got biodynamic chocolate, you know, and he told me about the whole process. And I'm like... Okay, no wonder it's so exp I mean, it's really good. I mean, it's really great chocolate, but it's also quite expensive. I mean, it's definitely on the gourmet end. And he's like, yeah, dude, let me explain how this is done. It's like, oh my God, you should be charging way more. It's such an insanely labor-intensive process, you know? It's, it's a labor of love, ultimately. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. a farmer and you're a student of the incredible teachings of Rudolf Steiner and where it can lead you as you... Because he, Rudolf Steiner, like all the great teachers, was like, look, take, here's my teaching and take it further. Figure it out yourself and, you know, take it further. And so I take his stuff and go, God, how can we, you know, because we're in the tropics. We're in Hawaii. How do we, how do we, he was in Germany. How do we right. take that teaching and we imply it He's here? like and, growing these really great potatoes. <laughs> yeah, right. We're like, yeah. potatoes? We've got breadfruit. We've got jackfruit. We've right. got durian. Right. You know, we've got all that great stuff. we got avocados. And um, I've been growing avocados, by the way, you know, David Avocado Wolf, just for those who are new or, you know, relatively new fans. Yeah. I've been growing avocados for 40 years. What? Damn. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you. I'll show you where I'm at with my avocado growth. I see, I see you on You've Instagram. Okay, if you guys yeah. haven't followed him on Instagram, you should because you'll learn a lot and it's just fascinating. I love watching your fascinating life of going to all the springs and being in the jungle and these enormous fruits and like <laughs> these bionic superfoods that you're growing and stuff. It's, it's really cool to document that stuff. It's great. I love, I love being able to, to, you know, with social media, what a blessing yeah. that I can share that magic. Isn't that like, cool? Oh, cool? It's super cool. Dude, I was thinking about that this morning, you know, as I, I always, you know, have my YouTube video here, a real video camera, and then Instagram Live and Facebook Live. And I was thinking this this morning. I was like, God, it's so cool. It's like any person can basically have their own TV network and radio network. I mean, I was like, I have my own radio show. I can do whatever I want, you know, whatever I want within reason, of course. And uh, I mean, you might lose some fans if you get too out there or not PC, but... It's just like, I can just broadcast from anywhere. In fact, I did a show the other day and I ran out and met the person at their car and was like, hey, they're here for the interview. And it's like, I'm showing the world the whole process. It's just, if you could go back 20 years and explain that to someone, it would sound like the Jetsons. You're like, oh, right. It really yeah. is. You it know really, what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm so glad you appreciate that. And, and I hope everyone who's watching appreciates that. It's a miracle. It's, I, I'm in my, in my bathtub at four in the morning you know, I like stumble out of bed. And I basically, one of the things that I want to tell you about, because you love the hot cold and you love the Wim Hof method. Yeah. One of my favorite things is to sleep freezing. Yeah. So in really cold weather, you don't use any blankets or you just use like one, like my poncho, that's it, naked. And I basically am freezing while I'm sleeping. And then you don't need to sleep that much. 
right? Because when you do sleep, you go, you're much deeper. You know how you're better off yeah. sleeping cold yeah. than warm. This is the battle of my life. I have two devices in my bed to make it cold, and I still can't ever get there. To get that deep, Yeah, I mean, deep, I like, like it really cold, too. It's, it's the yeah. best, you know, when you're freezing and sleeping. But sometimes if I'm doing that, I'll wake up at 4 in the morning. I'm charged up. So I'm like, what can I do? Okay, let me go sit in my bathtub. I'll throw a bunch of Icelandic sea salt in there, a bunch of essential oils, and then I'll put, set up my, my little stand on my phone, and I'll just watch stuff. Oh, you know, unbelievable videos and all kinds of things on social media and get three hours of education in on what I want to watch. Right. That's crazy. Right. That's I mean, the other side of it too, not only as like a content producer, but as a consumer of that content, you really do have an unlimited supply. Like when we were kids, we were on the same age. It's like, uh, I feel like watching TV, <laughs> there's yeah, like, 12 choices. Here, there's Gilligan's Island, <laughs> yeah. the Brady Bunch, whatever, you know, like some, <laughs> yeah, some kind of like doom and gloom news report, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, but then it was like Cheers or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and then so you're kind of like, cool, out of those 12 options, what do I want? And then cable happened and you have, whoa, there was 100 channels or whatever, but still not really. You couldn't get that nuanced with your area of, of research, you know, so I, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I always think about stuff like that too because I think we kind of, as humans, get spoiled. I know that I do. I'm just like, ah, I just take everything for granted and I get all pissy because my iPhone won't work. And it's like, dude, you know how ridiculous you're being right now? It's, we are so lucky. If something has a bug here or there, it's like, wow, imagine where we were you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's crazy. And then, then the whole thing of like, if you play an instrument. So I've been playing the drums since I was like 18 years old. And now I can study with the greatest drummers in the world every single night right there. They're teaching me. Right. That's nuts. I dude, I've been that's what I geek out on the most is you I'm a bass player by trade uh, in the past, but I love guitar. You know, I have two guitars in the house. And all I watch on YouTube is like guitar players. You know, like I'll watch Slash do a little lesson or John Mayer, watch old blues guys, and it's like I can't even begin to play the stuff they're playing. But it's fun to just kind of be inspired and see what's possible. And then I'll sort of, you know, translate it back to my level of ability and try to get better. But there are really good tutorial videos too. Where they'll, so many. You know, they'll slow it down and kind of do, you know, an augmented version of it until you can catch up. So yeah, it's really, it's really cool. We have in, like the unlimited university of information. Um, editor, quick uh, edit. Elliot, would you do me a favor and plug the power into that video camera? I just realized I don't see it plugged into the power strip, and it will Good. it'll die soon. It's um it's over in that plastic pelican case, okay. and you'll you'll it's on the um this side of the camera. What you'll a see. cool setup you've got here. So you you've got, I, I see the lenses you've got clipped onto that phone there, yeah. onto that there, iPad. There, and I got mics in there too because the sound inherently sucks on those devices uh, and you can you can really boost up the the sound level and also a little bit of EQ and then those are wide angles so I can have them closer because you're doing the live feeds if they're too far away then the sounds very faint right so the closer so you, you can get them the closer you are to the mic geez excellent yeah but it's cool they do those fit in a little suitcase and you uh, can that bring little, that whole set yeah I bring it to New York all the time and I'll, I just did like 15 interviews last time I was there. I'm running around Manhattan with that little case and my whole setup is in there. That's incredible. Except the video, you know, the video camera, but the whole live streaming and all this audio. Is that good, Al? Yeah, I got the green light. Now you've gotten your podcast up there, up in the ranks now, as, I, as I'm noticing. Dude, right? it's, it, it, where, where are you at? It, I'll tell you. It's, are you good, Al? I believe so. Let me just double check. Um, yeah, I think you're in the right hole. <laughs> Wrong hole. I couldn't I resist. Good. You good? Yeah. Okay, thanks, buddy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can start that again. Okay, editor, we're back in. Okay. Your podcast is blowing up. I'm starting to see reports of like, Luke Story's podcast made it into the top 200. Is that true? What's yeah, going on with your yeah. podcast? Yeah, like I'm at around uh, 115 or something. Actually, I haven't checked in a couple of weeks in, wow. in iTunes. Yeah, yeah. And I hit a million downloads uh, on, on New Year's. And you know, when it all started actually was uh, you and I did a talk at Neil Strauss's Intensive a couple of years ago, about two years ago. And it, I always tell this story because it was it was a really pivotal moment. You know, as you know, I've been working in fashion and doing all this stuff, and uh, and you know, just this has always been my passion. And then Neil said, "Hey, uh, you know, help me put together some speakers." And I said, "Oh, you know, you got to get Jack Cruz and Dave Asprey and David Wolf and dropped him a bunch of names. I think he already had you in mind and might have even booked you." And I was like, "Oh, cool." So it was just fun for me to help curate that group. And then I was really actually shy to ask, but I, I texted him one day and I was like, hey dude, totally no pressure as a friend, but man, I know about this stuff too. It'd be really fun to come do a little piece, you know? 
And he's like, yeah, cool. You just come and go on right before or after David Wolf. And I was like so nervous because I've been watching you speak all these years. So I was like, dude, I don't know how to talk about this stuff. Like put me on Sunday morning or something. Give me a break, you know. So it was like this high pressure thing. But I did it. And the guys in the group, there's about 100 guys. They just loved my talk. Yeah, you did really good. I remember Thank that Thank you. Talk. And yeah. so, uh, so at that point, it was kind of like, hmm, wow, maybe I could do something in this space. And so, yeah, the podcast has been great. And thank you for coming on before in the early days, too, when it was like, I did, you know, it was new. I had 10 episodes out or something, and you did it. And I got a lot of really big guys in the health scene to do it, which was a big, cool. yeah, it was a big boost, you know, because that, once you anchor in like a big name, of course, it, it's a domino effect and helps you to book other people down the road. I'm sure you know from booking speakers and things like that. So if I can say, hey, I've got David Wolf and da-da-da and rattle off a few names, then people downstream are like, oh, if he did it, I'll do it. But yeah, it's, dude, it's been amazing because this is um, like you. You found your passion early on and it's taken me quite a while to kind of find my, my competence and the passion all in one, like something I'm good at and something I really enjoy. There's often been a mismatch or I'm passionate about something, but I'm not that good at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, it looks like, like the setup you've got and just your overall like love for the the podcasting essentially and the, yeah. and the blog vlogging I guess is yeah like, dude it, I it mean that's through. A, I like through. I like the uh, I like producing content I think it's the musician part of me where you, you know you go in the studio and you like tracks and you're writing and all that and you're documenting and then putting it out in the world I still kind of really get off on that process of capturing something like and I want to get into the stem cell stuff but I just did I was telling you a little bit like why I have two black eyes right now uh, so I just went to Utah Park City and I did the stem cell treatment and I it was just so fun doing that because it's been on my vision board for a long time and I went out there and I interviewed two doctors and then I also had a, and it put it on video and then we had a video crew uh, then right after the interviews uh, filmed the surgery. <laughs> So and I and I live streamed it on Facebook and Instagram like from the operating room all the blood and guts and needles and saws and everything like that and so I'm I'm actually editing a video of the interviews and then it's going to be spliced in with the gory you know hammering the spike into my hip bone to get bone marrow and all that stuff so it's really fun to be able to do all this crazy stuff but also share it with people and people are inspired and they learn a lot so I'm having a blast cool yeah so amazing. you did the bone marrow they got in there yeah well and that's how I wanted to talk to you about this too. Um, because I feel like I could talk about uh, the <laughs> Rudolf Steiner for about four hours with you, but there's so many areas I want to dip into. But you're an early adopter of stem cells. I heard you talking about this for a long time, and I want to get your experience. But yeah, I, I did it with Dr. Harry Adelson and Dr. Amy Killen in Park City, Utah at Doceri Clinics. And uh, what they do is they do fat-derived, where they lipo out fat out of your, your back fat, your, your, your muffin top, and then they drill into your hip and get the bone marrow-derived stem cells. They mix those up with PRP and with this other thing called exosomes, this new random derivative of stem cells or something, and shot them all over my body, you know, the Jeez. IV. Uh, into, joints? Did you get them Yeah, in into joints? two of my discs, into my sacroiliac joint, which is my main uh, pain point for like 20 years, just gnarly, nothing's fixed it. And then I got it in my hip socket, in my hip joint, and in my, uh, in my shoulder. What's that thing called? Your, uh, your shoulder uh, In the shoulder joint. capsule. Yeah, right inside the shoulder, shoulder joint, shoulder joint, and then here's the, and then their Dr. Amy does the beauty part and sexual optimization. So they're like, hey, you're gonna be here, you're gonna be under, we're gonna have all your stem cells and all this goo around. Uh, we can also put it in your face for you know, uh, long, uh, what do you call anti-aging, right? Yeah. And I'm like, sure, I'm 47, I could use some of that. And then they put it in your scalp for hair loss. And then the clencher is, and they're like, if you want, we can also shoot it into your penis for sexual performance and just, you know, sexual health, really. And uh, so I'm like, I'm going to be out. What the hell? So they just did all that in a couple hours, and I broadcasted it all live, you know. So you've seen Luke Story's penis now live, <laughs> yeah. well, being I think, injected. Actually, I was cognizant enough before I went under. I was like, actually, you guys should hold a sheet up. You know, I'll probably get kicked off YouTube or something like that. And I'm sure it was very flaccid being under and... That would be uh, probably mortifying. But anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> oh, tell me, when you, did, when you talked about stem cells, you were going down to Guadalajara where yeah. they can extract and then culture and multiply the stem cells. So what was your, your experience like in doing that and how much of it have you done and what effects have you seen? I've done five stem cell treatments. Whoa! Yeah. And um, the first one, so the first treatment, this is back four years ago. And the first one was 
a bone marrow extraction. So they need a sample of your stem cells because no longer do they have your umbilical cord or cord blood or anything like that. So we, they, we have to get the best possible sample, which is going to come out of your bone marrow. You can also derive from fat or, or blood as well. But my take on it is your bone marrow is the best source. And what the first treatment is, they're going to take your bone marrow juice out they're going to freeze it and then later they can separate it out, get the stem cells out and then multiply those for future treatments, not the first right, one. Right, right. And then they, But that you can't do in the U.S. You cannot do this in the, yeah, in the U.S. That yeah. part. That the part. The multiplying. Okay. And then they take the bone marrow juice that they have extracted and put that back into you, the part that's not being frozen and the part that's not being sent to the lab. Let's, say, let's just say they took eight ounces out, one ounce goes to freeze, one ounce goes to the lab. Those remaining six ounces are going to go into your blood. So essentially what they're doing is they're taking bone marrow juice and they're putting it into your blood. And that within five days, cracked tooth that I had, I, I cracked it 30 years previous, 30 years previous. And eventually I cracked it really badly and on a trip in Australia the year before, it started to generate pain. Next thing you know, I was in excruciating pain. The dentists are like, we gotta pull that tooth. I'm like, you're not pulling nothing, forget it. And then eventually, I, I just by I just by and by the way, sometimes if you have an inner voice that's telling you like no, you know, stick it out. I stuck it out. I went a year in pain, and then I had that stem cell treatment, and which was just the bone marrow juice put into my blood. It's just the IV. Not that's local it. Local shots. Oh, okay. Yep, that's just it. And within five days, that pain was gone. Never came back. Eventually, that tooth broke apart, and you know because it was broken and cracked and stuff. Yeah. But it broke apart with no pain, and I never had to have it pulled out. Wow, really? Yeah, I mean, Dude, that's, that's crazy. Right? It's yeah. like, and so I just, that's just one of those things. Again, it's, you got to trust your instincts and intuition sometimes. And against all, everyone's better judgment, they're like, you have to go to the dentist. The dentist's like, you have to have that thing pulled. I was like, nope. And next thing I know, guess what? Wow. Yep. And eventually lost that tooth without any pain or problem. Did you see Dr. Uh, Villarreal? Was he oh, he was on my case. To? Like, I've got to, we got to pull that thing out. <laughs> Dr. Laurie was on my case. We got to pull that thing out. Because you is, have access to the best, like, holistic dentist in the world, like Dr. David. That's, yeah. That's the guy that I go to. So he's great. It's not I mean, like you're going to, like, the, you know, the little uh, local mini mall guy in Koreatown who's like, hey, let me pull this and make 800 bucks. Right. These yeah, are no. legit dentists. This was going to be like a six to $8,000 surgery with Dr. David Villarreal. Oh, my God. And I was like, oh, Oh, forget it. No way. Yeah. I'll, I'll get a, I can still chew on that tooth. Yeah, if anything gets caught in there, I'll be in you know very intense pain or whatever. But eventually, that all went away. And then, then that on the second round, I brought my mom, and right. I put that actually in my in my beauty diet book. It is in my new book. Um, the whole story of how I went down there with Hulk Hogan and his wife and my mom. And by the way, my mom and Hulk Hogan together. I mean, you, it, you talk <laughs> about like beyond the imagination, what you could never possibly conceive of as a kid. You know, that reality of those two, they are just a hoot together. That's, That's really funny. great. How did you, you know him from Hawaii or something? No, I, I met him through Dr. Gonzalez, who's oh, the okay. stem cell guy. And, oh, okay. and he coordinated us to come down at the same time. And just so happened that my mom was on the same flight oh, wow. out of Las Vegas and, and t was sitting right next to him and his wife. And then they realized, oh, we're all going down in the same place together. Wow. I was on a different flight. That's crazy. And so we, you know, then we, it just all worked out amazingly. Right, right. And it was it was just a wonderful time that we had down there together. And what? Uh, how how did your mom fare? So within okay, so we my mom had the exact same treatment where they just took her bone marrow juice mm -hmm. and put it into her blood. She didn't have any of the other stuff, which yeah. we did eventually do later on future trips. Yeah, where they injected her joints, they injected her neck where she had arthritic troubles. Right. And within like four hours after the treatment, you know where you know you're, you're, you they put you under with propofol. Mm -hmm. It's about a 20 minute anesthetic. It's an alcohol mm -hmm. anesthetic. Propofol. Do you breathe that one? Or was it an IV? It's an I, it's a, They inject it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't inject it. They put it into your IV. You know, they gradually yeah, add yeah, it to your yeah. IV solution. Yeah. Anyway, so what ended up happening is my mom and I and all the doctors and everybody and Hulk and everybody, we all went out to some Mexican restaurant in Guadalajara. You know, it's like one of the like serious Mexican restaurants where they serve like cooked crickets and like the whole like full thing, <laughs> right. big thick tables made out of giant pieces of wood, slabs of wood, you know, that kind of like authentic tequila Mexican restaurant yeah. in the heart of Guadalajara. And my mom, I was on one side, you know, kind of like slammed in there, you know, I could barely even like breathe because this table was so big and just sticking right into my gut. And next thing I know, my mom just completely forgot she was just in a surgery, so to speak, completely forgot that she'd been arthritic, completely forgot 
anything. I mean, I've never seen her do this, not when she was 30, not when she was, not when I was born. Did she ever do anything like this? She jumped up on her chair in the Mexican restaurant and jumped on Hulk Hogan's back. <laughs> I've seen your mom too. This is a great picture. I'm always like in the elevator with your mom at uh, Longevity. Yeah, for Downtown. some reason, yeah, right? That's weird. just like how yeah, it yeah. works out. Yeah, it's funny. And I was, and I, I'm on the other side, like mortified and horrified of like, you can't do this. And I like literally like had to like squeeze out from behind this thing, jump over the table and like literally bear hug my mom off of Hulk Hogan's back because my mom suddenly thought she was like a professional wrestler and was like going to choke Hulk out or something. I mean, I just had never seen anything like it. Wow. She, that's the power. I've noticed this with healing and I want to mention this. It's an important thing. If you're in the healing field, in the health field, it's a very important insight. Sometimes when somebody's healed, usually they're very thankful for the help that, that you've given them. Sometimes they completely forget that they were ever ill. They forget about you and they go back to normal. And that's good too. Okay, cool. Sometimes they hate you. That's another one, by the way. Sometimes they absolutely despise you um, for helping them and healing them they, they, for whatever reason. That is, a, that is a thing I have noticed over the years. Now, just, just wanted to put that out there. Do you think it's because they're psychologically identified with their illness, their Or they, they lost that, that you helped them in some way and they, they're, they, they didn't need any help. They're better than that. Oh, or, you know, okay. It's an ego thing or whatever. Right. That is a reaction. If you're in the health field, it's something you should be aware of. Um, yeah. It's a weird thing, but it's, it's definitely out there. And, but my mom's case, she forgot everything. She completely forgot she was ill. She forgot she was arthritic. She forgot everything. I mean, she went down there in a wheelchair. She was walking the next day. Dude, that's crazy. The next day we that's flew back crazy. to LAX. We went into Terminal 5, which isn't the international terminal. Yeah. We had to walk all the way to the international terminal to get our luggage and then all the way back to Terminal 5 again. And my, and my mom did that with bags, without needing any assistance, walking herself. We walked, I'm not kidding, it was like a kilometer distance. Yeah, that's a and long way. And I was way. like, you're I'm okay. You're, the airport, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you're yeah. fine. She's like, oh yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, Terminal 5 is like all the way down at the east end, and the international is right in the middle of that U. That's so right, I've, yeah. I've had that happen where they reroute. I show up and think it's one gate, and they're like, oh no, you got to go down. It's it's a long way. It's a long way. Yeah. And and I was, you know, I'm just observing, because my mom's like, all of a sudden, she's like, oh no, I'm fine, or whatever, because she forgot that wow. she was in a, even arthritic. And I'm just watching this going on. Eventually we got her, her, once they have your sample, then you don't have to do the bone marrow thing yeah. again. They just, what they say, they, they expand those cells from say yeah. 10,000 to 150 million, 200 million, 300 million. Then they'll take 40 million, put it in this joint, 40 million, put it in that joint, 40 million here, 40 million here. You know, the rest they'll put in your face, they'll put in your back, they'll put wherever you need it. Yeah. My mom, in her case, it was her shoulder in this area here. And that, Essentially, she's cured. I mean, I she doesn't have arthritis. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's she, and she's out of pain. That's so and she's forgotten about it. That's the only thing. Like I, got, I think I, I got the most cutting edge service that's available in the United States. But I, you know, and I'm very grateful. I'm not at all complaining. But I couldn't help think about the multiplication. You know, because even Dr. Harry's like, well, we're going to probably take 10 million out. But if you did the thing in Panama or whatever, it'd be 200 billion or something, you know what I mean? Right. Some like, astronomical what? number. And I was like, well, are more better? He's like, yeah, probably. You know, and also with the younger ones, you know, getting the umbilical cord stem cells and those ones that are a little more controversial. We should, we should mention that right there. Okay, so the umbilical cord cells are the best. Um, and they do that in Guadalajara, they do that in Cancun, they do that in Panama, many of those places. The problem that I have with that is it's not from my kid. Right, right. You know what I mean? There's more what if DNA. we learn later and it's like, it, I, it just doesn't, if it was my kid, you bet I'm taking those umbilical cells, you bet, inject them everywhere, definitely. Um, yeah. And say, you know, both for mom and dad, and then of course you want to freeze those cells for that child for the rest of that child's life. They ha you have their original umbilical cord and cord blood cells, and you want to freeze that. So if you're pregnant, you're going to have a baby, you, you definitely want to bank that umbilical cord, you want to bank those cord blood cells. And the parents want to partake in that because that may right. be the most powerful. But the thing about it is, it's got to be your kid, in my opinion. Yeah. That's just my position on it. Yeah. Um, you it's know, a little I'm, spooky. It is. It's like, yeah. I don't want some other kids. Well, I remember maybe cord 15, 20 cells. years ago when I first started hearing about the stem cell thing, there was places in Tijuana where you could go get like pig and goat stem cells and stuff. And I was intrigued for a minute just because it was so supernatural X Men vibe, which I was like, oh, it's kind of cool. But. Opted again, like you were mentioning the intuition. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna wait. 
I don't know, wait a bit. And now no one seems to be doing that. And it's all about just the human derived cells. Yes. Uh, what Dr. Harry was telling me in Utah is that in the U.S. now, the, you know, the, the laws are nuanced and it depends on the state. And you know, it's very confusing uh, in terms of just the legalities of it. But he said that there are now companies that will buy women's, um, you know, they, they screen these women that are about to have a baby and then they actually buy the umbilical cord. And then they create these stem cell concoctions and they sell it to anti-aging doctors and doctors that use stem cells. So wow. I had some of those in me too, I think, which I was kind of stoked about. Because that sounds like something that would be hard to get past the FDA and you'd have to do out of the country, which is, you know, of course, just so much more of a hassle and so much more expensive. But I'm fascinated to see. So did you have any particular issues other than your tooth that seemed to magically get fixed and and also did you end up having any local injections for a bum knee or anything that I don't have anything like that you know like I don't have a bum knee or bum elbow or whatever so I have never had the localized injections right. I just get the IV right. of my of my stem cells and um, after the tooth thing I didn't really have anything that was like specific but there are things you notice um, and and it reminded me back in the old days of you know going to the Dr. Hit Center down in in Tijuana you know I worked with Dr. Hit for 10 years down there and he ran a Tijuana clinic, you know, where we dealt with cancer patients every day, you know, terminal cases daily. People covered in their body, 95% covered in herpes, you know, gnarly stuff. Just imagine what it takes to get down to a Tijuana clinic for your average American. And this is back 20 years ago. Right. Right. And what we did two things. We did ozone. And we did a lot of other stuff too, but we did the main thing was ozone and then urine injection. Oh, right? wow. And the yeah, urine yeah. injection thing was like, you know, that was... Doc, Dr. Hit figured that out from, you know, back working with Papilloma back in 1949, 1950, 1951. Dr. Hit was one of my mentors. Um, he taught me about what he learned about virology and what he learned about um, immunity. And basically the antigens and antibodies that your body's fighting, dealing with, right? So, the, you know, the antibodies that your body produces to deal with the antigens, um, especially with an aggressive cancer, the coding, the antigens change on that cancer daily. And if and your body's producing antibodies against that coding, but then the next day it's something different. All of a sudden, your body goes, "Where is it? What's going on?" You know, and then the next day it would be the next thing is, "What's going on?" It's gone. That's why people die of cancer. Their body, their immune system can't get on top of it. And Dr. Hit found that the urine injection, so the first clear urine midstream, he would take a little bit of that with lidocaine and he'd inject it into the fat tissue, and it's basically a vaccine. Um, that was, I mean, I saw that over ten years. It, and that was effective? Miraculously effective. That's crazy, dude. I forgot about the, the urine injections because for a time, because I've just tried everything, I was doing the um, auto urine therapy where you drink you know, a shot glass every morning of that midstream urine. Right. People, people listening are like, I'm canceling yeah, this right. show. Know, yeah, you, that, They're like, I'm not listening I, to this I get, jackass I get anymore. how gross you know, that is. But, but, but here's the thing. When you look at it, urine is actually sterile. It's not like feces or yeah no, i mean saliva is a million times more disgusting than uh, it's essentially like clarified blood almost you know yeah your urine. that's right and, and so it, but it contains the immunological codes and that's the key thing and and so when let's say let's say in the case you're drinking it right out of a hundred scale of a hundred the immunological impact is about a one which is something which means you get a homeopathic hit that your body goes hey oh this is what we're dealing with if you did it as an enema for example it's about a 10. But a urine injection is like a, a hundred. Wow. Yeah. And Dr. Wow. Hit, you know, Dr. Hit was Doctors Without Borders. I mean, he's one of the most amazing beings I've ever known in my life. I mean, just imagine, you know, you get to a Tijuana clinic after all the, you've been cut, burned, poisoned, you've been lied to, you've, you've been through all medicine, you've, all, you're out of money, you're, you know, you're at the end of your rope, you're dying of cancer. All of a sudden, you know, they'd be, they'd be in Dr. Hit's office and I'd be, you know, on the outside watching and be like, they'd be angry and yelling and vicious. And, you know, to, you know Americans can be very, very vicious when it comes to this kind of thing because the brainwashing is so intense, yeah. you know, that we've all undergone. And Dr. Hit would just smile and be, and he just, <laughs> it was the best. He'd go, are you ready to try alternative medicine? <laughs> they're ah, yeah, and they just put all the anger and vitriol and hate and you know all that stuff would come out and they'd be and he'd just be like, Are you ready to try alternative medicine? He's just you know, he's almost like Herman Munster, he had that deep, gravelly voice, big, big guy. And eventually they go, Yeah. And he'd go, Okay, here's it. And then he start them into the urine injection, urine vaccine, and how we're gonna do ozone, and then we do vitamin mineral pushes on them. And then um, you know, they'd be in there. Sometimes twice a week or sometimes once a week for eight weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks. So I'd see them repeatedly and I'd be in the room with them and I'd always get a treatment too whenever I was down there working with them. And, um, 
and we'd coach them on nutrition, getting the fungus out of the diet and getting the, the sugar out in, in particular. A lot of this was sugar, you know, a lot of these problems are sugar related. And people go, stomach cancer, brain cancer, they go back home cured 12 week, weeks later. And so that, you know, people don't know that about me. That's a perspective that I have, you know, coming from a family of medical doctors. I also have the experience of working in Tijuana clinics, you know, and anybody can look in the Tijuana clinics, punch that up online and what's going on down there. There's some miraculous stuff going on. And so I bring that perspective, no matter how avant-garde it is, it's like, I don't care if people hate me for talking about it or just can't understand the concept. Yeah, I don't care. If your life's on the line and you don't have any other choices, I want you to have that choice. Yeah, I, well I've noticed, and that's something actually I wanted to ask you about, was since you're outside of the matrix and unplugged from that whole paradigm, as am I and most people we would likely hang out with, you know, we, I call us fringe dwellers, you know, where you've sort of unplugged from the group think, uh, because people are so brainwashed, generally speaking, through media and whatnot, um, that there tends to be a lot of not just resistance or closed-mindedness, but a lot of hatred and demonization. And I asked you about like internet trolls and stuff when I first interviewed you on Skype. Mm -hmm. And you had a very thoughtful response to that, but then we didn't really dig into it, so I'd like to touch on that, but just to, to explain how your response impacted me, because now I'm becoming a little more public, and a couple, I'm not like heavily trolled, because I'm not unknown enough yet, but couple pop up and I'm like, I get a little bristly. You know, I, want, I feel myself wanting to respond and be like, oh, F you, man, I'll show you, you know. But you, your response was like, yeah, when people attack me online, and it was, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect that I just think about that person, I have so much compassion for them because they're, you, suffering so they're in bad. so much pain that they're actually going to take the time to sit down and go, okay, I'm going to work on my David Wolf smear campaign, you know, and just spew hatred. Like, you have to be in so much internal pain to have to express it in such a, you know, in such a way. And yeah. so I, I thought that was a really cool it's really the, It's really the truth. I mean, it's, yeah. and, and I, because I see that pain, right, from when people don't express it or when they do, and how intense it is, I know how deep the suffering is. And that's, that's wild. That's, you know, when you really, most people, because they're not big enough on social media or haven't been out in the public enough, you know, I've been out in the public for 25 years, I, I, I've been there they don't realize the level of suffering that's going on. They don't realize the damage that medicine is doing to people. They have no idea of the, you know, what, what it means to be on the losing team. And that's basically iatrogenic disease. People being killed by pharmaceutical medicine, doctors and hospitals is for 17 years straight, the number three cause of death in America, arguably number two. There is an argument you can make that it's number two. You're, that's the losing team. It's like, how much worse does it, does it have to get before you go, right. I want to get on the winning team? Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. So that's the way I like to put it. It's like, look, if you want to live healthy and you don't want to be suffering from all these immune catastrophes and you're worrying like, oh my God, what if I get cancer? Or anything, you don't need to be worrying about any of that. The solutions have been found, but it has nothing to do with the system that we're in right now. And so it's a process of extricating yourself out. And then there are, you know, what I love is when the people show up at my events and they're like, Dude, you were so heavily trolled online, I knew there was something good here. Right, so it actually attracts people because whoever's doing the trolling are the, not the team they want to be on. Yeah, because they look at right. it and they're like, well, this is like gnarly. Like, why are these people so, you know, intensely I mean, that's, upset? That, that's the thing, but like, you in particular really trigger people. I mean, there's other people, and it, part of it's you've been around for a long time, so there, you've been able to amass a huge following, and of course, there's going to be a, a larger group of people that are anti David Wolf theory, right? But I see other people online that have a very strong opinion. You've got your Dave Asprey and different guys that are prominent in the industry. And, you know, people talk a little shit here and there, but there aren't like Facebook pages and whole websites dedicated to defamation of their character. You know, it's like there's like serious anti David Wolf, almost like propaganda out there. And what I'm wondering, and, and get your perspective on this, is I mean, some of that I think has to be coming from within the pharmaceutical industry and big agri and like, you know. They know. The I mean, them. At, at, yeah, the so very, there's at this the very debunking high. of your, your theories yeah. and your teaching. I don't care, you, you can debunk me all day long. You, when you're dying of cancer and you're like, I, I'm on my last leg, you're gonna listen to me, I guarantee you. Once you've been through their system and they've run you over through the ringer and you're at the, your last moment and you're like, well, maybe I can break out of my pattern, 
you're gonna you're gonna tune in. And I've had that happen. I've had people tell me that they they were they hated me. They thought it was terrible. They thought it was crazy. But something you know cracked them, and all of a sudden they were able to crack themselves out and change their behavior and change their life and and get on the positive side. It is possible and it does happen. So I mean I don't you know I don't know how much you know trouble our, our civilization is in, but I suspect it's in very serious trouble. And the powers that be suspect that. And they don't want you getting off the losing team. They want you going down with the ship. They want to make sure, oh, just let them, all those, all those lemmings, let them go off the cliff. And so the brainwashing, the programming, the scientism, the fundamentalism, who's suffering from that? The, the people themselves. You know, it's a, and so, you know, what can I do? I just, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, I'm going to lay it out and lay your options out. What I love about it too is, you wanted to learn about stem cells, I'll open the door for you. You go talk to all these doctors, your doctors, go talk to Rafael Gonzalez, go talk to our friends down in Guadalajara, talk to the stem cell clinic down in Cancun, and then you'll find out what's going on and I will have opened that door for you. So if you right. want to troll that, you know, you, your own, you're only trolling your own demise. Do you ever edit some of the stuff that you feel like you want to publicly talk about in you know, geoengineering or EMFs and smart meters. There's like a lot of very conspiratorial 5G. There's a lot of really gnarly stuff, I think, that's out to get us for whatever reason, probably just greed and profit motive and just the ignorance of the public's general health and safety. Do you ever want to post about something that's a bit controversial and hold yourself back, or do you just literally just unfiltered this is what I feel like sharing about. I usually just post it, <laughs> and do? that's why. And that's why you know the powers. Like basically, you know, people who are in the matrix and they're you know they they're in the blue pill, they're going to go with what the agenda wants. You know, big pharma says you we're going to push this. They're going to go along with that. At the highest level, of big pharma they know who I am, and right. big oil they right. know, and big banking they know, and so they are concerned, right? Because they have a concern that their agenda is going to be exposed. Right when we like Dakota Access Pipeline, I was there at Standing Rock. I was there when Democracy Now found out 38 banks were backing that thing. We didn't know that. Four oil companies, 38 banks, and people go, "How could 38 banks be hiding this from us?" And well, let me tell you how. The people who work in banks are normal people like you and I. The people who work at many levels of banks are normal people like you and I. But the people who matriculate to the top of these big oil corporations, big banking enterprises, big governments, are. In some cases, not all, sociopathic and psychopathic. We all know that. We all know that yeah. corporations attract to the top sociopathic and psychopathic people. And they have agendas in mind that have nothing to do with our well-being, that have nothing to do with the well-being of the earth, have nothing to do with the well-being of Native Americans. And their main weapon is deception. Their main weapon is keeping you in the dark. You don't want to do, we, 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 what are you talking about? We don't have anything to do with Dakota Access, Access Pipeline until literally there's people protesting in the streets and pulling their money out of Wells Fargo Bank, which you should pull your money out of Wells Fargo Bank, um, and put it in credit unions. And, and just the understanding of how evil works helps people to go, oh, because you know when you, when you talk about stuff like geoengineering, people are like, how could they be hiding it? They're not hiding. It. <laughs> right, it's dude. not hidden. It's, Look up. Yeah, it's just like yeah, yeah. And, and even if you Google around, like I found a video uh, the other day about geoengineering. It was like the former head of the CIA, like there, openly, it's openly, he's it's, openly talking about it. But the way he was talking about it was, well, we're thinking about doing this someday in 25 years. I'm like, no, I started seeing that in like '95. I lived in LA since '90, and then around '95, '96, I'd look up and go, uh, what's that? And everyone around is just like. Oh, everything's normal. It's all good. Nothing to see here. And I'd start talking about it, and people would look at me like I was crazy. Now it's becoming a little more widely known, but it, it's so interesting how the deception is so right in your face, but we're so brainwashed that we just go along. Oh, CNN said this. This is what the truth is. The first, the first red pill for me was this, and I want to hear what yours was. This was when the, the window started to crack, is um, right after 9 11. And the internet was, I don't know, I feel like relatively new then, you know? And someone sent me this video, maybe it's a YouTube video, and it was just about the Pentagon. And it was just basically a 15-minute little video that said, hey, did you ever notice there's actually no plane ever at the Pentagon? Like that went, During 9-11? Yeah. 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 I, was like, <laughs> there, there's, I was like, well, no, I saw on the news, it said, oh, and that's number flight number whatever has crashed the, into the Pentagon. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what happened. I mean, why would I ever even question that? That's what I saw on TV. And this video 
kind of indicated, well, did you really see it? And it posed that question. I thought, well, no, I didn't actually. I mean, you saw the planes going to the Twin Towers. That happened. Building 7, that's all other issue. Uh, no planes hit that, and it's 47 stories, steel frame building that just and, imploded. And BBC announced that it had crashed. And meanwhile, behind the woman's shoulder, it's still standing there. <laughs> right, right. So, like, certain mistakes like that. Right. But it was at the Pentagon, I thought, well, you know, where are they going with this? This can't be true. And then they proceed to show you that there's no fuselage, there's no wings, there's no people, there's no bodies, there's no seats, there's no freaking plane on the premises. There's just a big round hole with no wing holes in the side of the Pentagon. And that's when my whole world just went like, ah! and then I found David Icke and Alex Jones and like all these fucking really out there guys who, you know, have some very out there ideas to this day. But it's not all untrue. You know, there's a lot of truth if you start digging. It takes a bit of discernment not to just go along with the whole other side of it either. That's what Rudolf Steiner's really whole thing is, is like, you, yeah, you could get flung out of, say, scientism, right. but then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're into escapism. Right. You know, or, you know, you have to be careful you don't go flying all the way the other way, and you try to hold that, that cosmic center, right. you know, which is very important, and I think that's what you're driving at. And so the thing that woke me up, at, if that was your question, yeah, was, yeah, was, what the, was your the banking scam. Oh, the Federal and, Reserve and The Federal all Reserve and all that. And I got wind of that. I, I was lucky. My next door neighbors when I was a kid growing up were, they owned like 20 grocery stores, very wealthy family. And they, and they would, when I come back from school, they'd be there and, and they would be, you know, because they used to come over all the time. And they'd be like, what did they teach you in school? And I'd be like, oh, this, this, and that. And they'd be like, let me tell you about that person because we lived back then and this person was a crook. And, you know, they would, get, they would tell me about like the corruption in government. So I had that in from a very early stage that there could be corrupt people in government and that there's like bag men, you know, would like, you know, they'd take the money and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was the mafias were involved in government. I had no idea about any of that. And then step by step, when I was about 18, I started realizing that there's something very fraudulent about banking and, it, you know, the fractional reserve lending. And that's what, that was the thing that woke me up. Can you, can you give a, a, a brief, a summary of what that means. I think a lot of people still think the Federal Reserve is part of the government, yeah. you know, because it has the word federal in it. There's a lot of deception just in the name, but what, how does that whole thing work? Okay, so the Federal Reserve is not a bank. It's a private group of, of um, investors, essentially. It's a pri private group of centralized banks from Europe, essentially, and individuals. And it's a cartel, actually. Be very specific, it's a cartel. And what they were able to do is take the power from Congress, which is an art, Article Two of the of the Constitution. The Congress is the only organization in the United States that can print money. And in 1913, maybe it was 1911, somewhere in there, they over it was right it was right after the Titanic went down, which is related, by the way. They um, maybe it was 1911 where they installed the Federal Reserve Act, which took power away from Congress. So instead of Congress going, oh, there's a value here, we'll just create money out of nothing to correlate to the value. So for, let's say you and I are we're Native Americans. We we don't have nothing. We you know you're naked, I'm naked. We're in the forest. But one day I go, hey, you know, I want to build a bridge to get over to you because you've got wampum over there on your little seashore. That I want to collect and I want to use for whatever. So that bridge that I build is created out of nothing. I create it from my own hands and I create that value and that is correlated to money in the system. That has a value. Let's say it's called five wampum right there. That's or five vanilla beans. Okay, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I want to create a boat, go over to you. Then you create a boat from nothing and then that boat suddenly, now we have 10 vanilla beans in our economy. This is how it's supposed to work. Instead of that, though, instead of just creating the money from nothing to correlate to the value created, the road, the infrastructure, the telephone poles, the electrical grid, right? Those are things created from nothing that are put into the system and now have a value associated with them, which creates economy. Instead of that, now we have to borrow the money instead of just printing it to correlate to the value that's been created. And that's the deception, where money comes from. Money is created by humans creating. And the more creation that happens, more fireplaces, more buildings, the more value of the economy. Because there's been more creation. We don't need to borrow that money. We create that money to correlate to what's been created. And that's led us eventually with, the, with this deception of the Federal Reserve, it's led us into fractional reserve lending where not only are they lending you money, they're lending you money they don't even have. 
They're lending the U.S. government money, right? right? Okay. Yeah, and they don't even have it. Right. But once they've got everyone brainwashed, and once they've got the military and the police force to enforce their debt in your country, they they're running the country. They don't care who the government is. Right. So, so for example, like who owns this house? The bank. Right. Right. You're paying a mortgage. Yeah. To who? The bank. So who who owns the land? Not a government. The banks own the land. So they they don't care who the government is. Right. Because right? government is about right. who's controlling the land. Right. It's a it's banking enterprise. That's crazy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so it's just it I once I got wind of that, I was like, oh geez. And they and then they just it's a it's a perpetual deception based on miseducation. Right. So now now we have entire enterprise. Same with medicine. You know, I know this because I, I come from medical background, both my parents are doctors. The whole enterprise of medicine doesn't teach you all the whole perspective. It's only this part, right? right. They don't teach you nutrition. Right. You're lucky you get eight, hour, eight hours of nutrition in, in medical school. And so they're not giving you the whole picture. Right. Wow, that's so interesting. That's, that's you know, there's so many things that we just get indoctrinated into and we take for granted. That's why I love talking to people like you that are zoomed out going like, hmm, let's, let's get like, let's look at Earth from outer space sort of in a sense and like really look at what's going on over a, a more broad timeline because we're born and we're here our 80 years or whatever and we're just used to what it is. And, and this is something I always think about in terms of income tax that, you know, when we just had these tax cuts that Trump did or whatever, which I'm, you know, seems like it's benefiting the economy from my, you know, very broad understanding of how that all works, but although I'm obviously no expert. But everyone's talking about these tax cuts. And, you know, I talked to a friend of mine who he makes $10 million a year. He's into Bitcoin and investing and all this crazy financial stuff that I don't even understand. But he's a wealthy guy. And I said, well, how did those tax cuts work? It's great. You know, my corporate tax went from 35 to 21 percent or whatever it was. And everyone's really excited about that. But to me, I'm looking at that going, but you're still paying 21 percent for what? Right. It's not even legal. Like, yeah. in, income tax is not even legal in the United States. Like, it's not illegal, technically, uh, to not pay income tax. But there's also no laws protecting you from them coming and seizing everything you own if you don't pay it. But we've all just bought into this sort of hierarchy, um, you know, this royal family, royal bloodline thing where they're the stewards of the resources and they make the rules and they just take our money. You know, it's like, when did people just go, oh, that's okay. I'm cool with that. <laughs> it's, well, the, the, you know, David Icke's very good at this. It's the stepping stones approach. They, right. do, they don't do it all at once or will rebel. So they right. slowly and incrementally over hundreds of years, they go, you know, go, let's take a little of this and then we'll get that. And then next thing we'll take this thing over here and then we'll get that. Next thing you know, it's basically we've, we've turned into a statist economy, which means that, like, for example, the biggest investor in the U.S. economy by far on Wall Street is the U.S. government. This Department of Education in this town, the Department of, of the Interior in this state, all of these departments and all of these government agencies from the federal, the state, the city, county level have investments in Wall Street. And, and you know, that's the CAFR. Right, That's you, you know, I didn't about, know that. not the budget. They always like we we're, were having a budget deficit. No, they don't. There's no budget deficit. No, it's a complete lie. It's called the CAFR. The CAFR. Show me the CAFR. The CAFR is the actual money they have invested into Wall Street and invested into the economy. What does that mean? It means that like you pay taxes to like the Department of Education here in Los Angeles and Department of the Interior and all the other ones. And instead of them using that money to all of that money, say 100 percent of it, to just you know fix like education. 10% of it goes immediately into an investment portfolio oh, okay. that is exempt from the budget. Oh my God, dude. That's the CAFR. That's madness. And, and so th that can never be used to pay off budget deficits. Right. It's exempt. Right. So the money's there. Because this is the beef that everyone has whenever, you know, and as I said, I obviously don't understand the nuances of the economy and finance to that degree. I'm just zooming out going like, whoa, why do I give, you know, in LA, I mean, if you count up all the taxes from your car to property tax, this and that, I mean, it's for like 80% of your income. I mean, it just gets insane. It's insane. Yeah. Which is so close to slavery, yeah. you know? And statism. It's, yeah. It's socialism. It's what, you know, whatever, whatever the word <laughs> and is. I'm like, how, how are people going along with this? And when I talk about it with people, they go, well, I mean, who's going to pay for the roads and the city parks and, uh, you know. The, the government is making so much money on your investments 
be basically the dollars that you paid in taxes that they right. put in portfolios, they're making so much money on that that the whole economy could run just on the money they made on that every quarter. You don't ever need to pay taxes again. Just to put that, that's how much value has been created. Just look around, all these buildings, all the infrastructure, all the cable lines, all the fiber optics, all the communications. We should be living with a in total abundance, 100, we keep 100% of what we make. But see, that's, this is the thing about what Rudolf Steiner says about evil. Evil is parasitic. Evil's parasitic. And so it's gonna take, 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 but not give anything back. And that's what we're seeing more and more with more, you know, the more taxes, the more government, the more statism. Eventually they're taking, 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 but you're like, well, I've got potholes in the road over here and why is the whole street falling apart? And how come our education system is just like the bottom of the barrel? Where's all this money going? Right. Right. right, that's the thing with the national, it's like we have this national deficit. This is the first time we've ever talked about anything like this on the show, and it's a bit off topic, but it's so interesting. But we have this deficit that's just bigger than ever, trillions and trillions of dollars, an uncountable amount of money. But at the same time, as you said, the infrastructure in this country and the education system and so many systems are broken down and almost turning third world. So it's like, where'd all the money go? There's a deficit, and it's not being spent on the things that it's meant to be spent for. I mean, that's just a very obvious thing to it, see. It know? is an obvious thing to see. And, and so what we're, you know, where we are is we have to band together as a community, as a population and decide we're not going along with it because ultimately they need our assent to go along with it because then once, once it goes that next step, which is the government is actually at odds with the people, the people will then figure it out completely and go, this is, you know, it's almost there now. Right. In America, you can right. feel this place is headed towards a civil war. You can feel they want yeah. that actually, yeah. um, but you can feel that what's happening is that people go, the government isn't for me. They don't think about me. They don't want nothing to do with me. They're not helping me, right? You, you know that is the general consensus that's out there, and so we've got to now stop. See this? It's the statism. You know, the, the state's going to solve my problem. The state's going to be able to figure this out for us. And they don't, it, it's a parasite operation. They're not going to figure out anything. They're going to make it worse. Yeah, it's like we're looking at the medical system and all of these systems of our society as our parent figure, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a parent figure that's this rapacious taking entity, this parasitic entity. And those are the, the, the powers that be that we're looking to for protection and knowledge and structure and stability and safety. Well said. It's scary. Well said. I mean, I, I hope everyone got that point right there is that these, these organizations that we look up to and that should be actually guiding us, as we become more aware, we realize not only they, are they not guiding us, they're deceiving us. And that is a difficult pill. You know, that's why I get trolled so hard. Because people are like, no, there can't, this is science and there can't be a deception going on because peer review. And it's like, do you know how many deceptions go on in peer review? Do you, do you know how many art? Well, I, I pulled up research on 108, I think it was 108 peer reviewed articles where they found that the actual article had, was a deception and they had to overturn it and they had to er eradicate the article. Wow. That's a lot, just in the field of cancer, just in that area. Wow. So what's that mean? It means that, uh-oh, that's corruption. Uh-oh, what do you mean, you know, our science is corrupt? Yes, definitely. I'm into the scientific method. I'm not into scientism. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, which means that science can be corrupt, so I'm aware of that, and we should all be aware of that. That's a very important piece. And, and you can't just go, no, 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 it can't be corrupt. And with now scientism, which is the Big Bang, and Darwinism, and social Darwinism, and you know, all of that stuff is theoretical. It can never be proven. And so I'll take it and accept it as a theory, but I'm not going to accept it as a fact. And that's an important distinction there. And see, scientism is saying, no, these are absolute facts, and they're not. They're theories. Right. Because they're always in flux, too. That's the thing. That's, what can we say about science for sure? You know? There is one thing we can say for sure about the history of science. What is it? That it always changes. Thank you. Yeah. That's the thing. It's a moving target. Yep. You know, facts are almost a moving target. Yeah. But the, you know what? It's funny. I want to see what you think about this. You're, you're a fan of David Hawkins' work. You yes. Know? And we've talked about that and uh, we share that, you know, um, as fans. Um, but he always talked about this uh, ultimate truth, this absolute truth, and that there are spiritual principles inherent in the universe and that those are the only things that really never change. They're just unmovable, unchanging, and that's why, as we were talking about personal development, that any sort of uh, you know, group or society or system of thought 
that abides by those certain laws of nature, like love being one of them, or discipline, or honesty, or whatever, you could go on and on, that those are the actually only things that never change because they're aspects of God. But those are in the spiritual realm. I feel like everything else, like on the material and non-metaphysical, is what you're talking about in science, that it's a moving target, that it's just today it's true, tomorrow it's not true, which is weird to get. Well, it's, it's just imp- it's such an important perspective to have because whenever they're they're saying no 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 these are this is a this the science is settled on this all you have to do is just go back and learn from history that the science is never settled right um, there's changes that come along there's innovations that come along there's deception that has occurred that's been exposed right. and so that's what we're kind of finding out and what what you're saying is you know these these principles these ethical principles of of the universe. Very, very important, I think, for building a healthy civilization. In fact, that's kind of where I'm at. Is like I basically I live by the chivalric code. Yes, I've made mistakes. Everybody does. Scientism tries to pin your mistake of 20 years ago and say that's who you are. Doesn't allow you to change your behavior based on oh I made a mistake. Now I'm going to change my behavior and do something that's more integrous or more of what a cosmic knight would do. It's gotten so bad that basically, like in terms of the ethical and moral breakdown of civilization, in the, what you've just described, that there are principles of truth and honesty. It's gotten so bad that I basically don't even believe that it's even possible that the government is ever going to become moral or ethical or integrous. <laughs> right. you know, and so, so we have to re- go out of that and move towards us, our family, our friends, our, our community, and go, how do we live as knights? Yeah, you know, I like. What did you say? Cosmic, cosmic nights? nights. I like. Yeah. That. How do we live as, as you know? By that's the a chival- good band name. You're a drummer, a bass player. I see it. I see it down the, the road. cosmic <laughs> nights. That's a good one. <laughs> so, so you you're with me then on these unchanging, un immovable spiritual principles. Yes. And that if we can learn what they are and learn how to apply them in our life, that that is where that foundation and structure and stability can come from. Absolutely, and and then from there you can find the strength to go against the grain. Right, like I am one of the most ferocious people in going against the grain in the whole world. That's why the trolling is so intense. Right, I'm I'm forcing into people's consciousness other opinions, and and evil doesn't want that. Yeah. They don't want any other opinion. That's very prevalent in Hollywood, you know, with this last election cycle and everything that's going on politically and socially. And I and I always steer clear of getting too deep into those topics on the show because I probably would lose a lot of listeners. Yeah, and, but, and we don't, you know, who knows? I mean, but I don't, I don't. I'm not a political. Me either, and I don't, and I don't understand it enough. It's more like watching theater to me. But there are lives at stake in that theater. But what's interesting, just as a cultural phenomenon, living in Hollywood, which is this very insular and very hyper, almost pseudo-liberal uh, and hypocritic culture in a sense, if you really take a look at it with all of the sex abuse and pedophilia, but then all this yeah. virt- virtue signaling at the same time. Right, it's yeah. Like in Hollywood, Hollywood promotes violence and specifically gun violence and movies and billions of dollars are made. But on- it's created by people who are like, lim- we call them limousine liberals. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but less... that's where the you know then the gun control voice is coming from the same voice that's like, hey, watch this movie, give me fifteen dollars so I can buy another you know million dollar mansion somewhere, and it's promoting violence. And then the sex industry and the sex that sells in in movies and entertainment and media, those are the same people that are then telling you that you're wrong. You know, it's just it's backwards land. Everything's just upside down, and it's so interesting to to sort of watch. And I don't identify really with either side of that spectrum in terms of left or right. I feel like I'm like way out there beyond, you know, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. It's just, it's a wacky system and it's really interesting to watch, you know? I'm in the healing field and we're meeting people. I don't care if somebody's a Democrat or Republican or the conservative or liberal or whatever. We want to get them healthy. That's where we're at. It's like, I don't care. Well, you know, so what? You believe, whatever you want, whatever. I don't know what it is. We want to get you healthy, we want to get you happy, and, and then my goal is to remove obstacles that are in the way that can bring healing and health and happiness to people. Right. And you know that might mean, in a lot of cases, taking people to Guadalajara, take them out of this country so that they can get that what they want. But ultimately, right. you know, I am an idealist, probably too much of one. And I do you know, more and more feel that like, okay, these, ent- these competing energies in, in this world, like you know, what Rudolf Steiner calls the Luciferic and the Aramonic, Luciferic being the escapism, and then the Aramonic being the materialization and materialism, 
that you know staying in between there and trying to guide people is, to be in in between all that is really a higher calling than something like you should vote this way on you know this issue. Right. Right. Yeah. I think I think the thing that's interesting here is that there's not a lot of room for conversation. You know, that's the thing in our culture right now. It's so policed. It's so there's such a stranglehold on opinions or different points of view especially and it's it's very much magnified because being in this part of the world so that's why you know I said I don't talk about those things on the show because it's not really the format of the show and it's almost like not safe to even question anything that is commonly held in that belief system in the in the hive mind so it's like I just kind of I can find someone who's an outlier like you and talk about things from a different perspective where one's not identified with either side and can openly discuss like the pros and cons and look at things. I might talk to someone and they go, well, here's why we need taxes. And I'm willing to listen to that, even though presently I don't really agree. You know, there's always... That's, see, that's an important part of being a sane and rational human. And, right. and for whatever reason, I think we're getting driven towards irrational. Right. Well, as you said, it's almost like we're on the verge of a civil war because of the, 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 the two thought forms are sort of so polarized right yeah. now. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a fight. It's or, you know, if interesting. You, if you're like, hey, you know, like, how about this question? What do you think of this? Question mark. Like I did that the other day. Do you think this guy's a crisis actor? Question mark. I got a thousand trolls hit me all at once. I mean, <laughs> attack like all. Yeah. Like, it's a question mark. It's like I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, you can't ask questions anymore. Yeah. Don't, don't ask questions. What are you talking I, about? I really am paranoid to even, you know, talk about that school shooting. But there were a lot of really weird, an anomalous things about that. And I'm curious as to what actually happened. You know, there was different kids that were saying different things, and it was very strange. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't get involved because yeah, I'll get wrapped up and I'll know. trip yeah, down. Me and too. I'm definitely not going to comment on something like that. You're, you know, you're in a safer position perhaps to do so. But it's just so weird that you can't actually ask a question anymore without being vilified, as if you don't have compassion for, you know, a tragedy or something like that. Just because you're like, hey, what's the truth here? Let's take a look at it. I mean, even now, I think we're far enough away from 9-11, for example, where you can go, hey, isn't it weird that there's no evidence of a plane at the Pentagon? You know, I don't know if it's an inside job, whatever you want to call it, but there's something strange. Building 7, that's a little weird. There will come a time when we look back on the Las Vegas shooting and some of these other events, hopefully, and go, well, is it safe now to ask questions? Because the official story, whatever it is, in many cases, just doesn't add up just on a common sense level. Yeah. So. I, was, I remember on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I think it was in 2011, and I finally tuned in on the human element of it, like people jumping out of those buildings. Man, that was a rough one, I have to say. Yeah. You just, you know, I'm from New York, New Jersey originally, and, and I was up in those towers in 1977 with my family. We went up there, you know, when they were first opened to the public and right. all that kind of stuff. And that, you know, the human element of this stuff is really intense. But in order for us to prevent it in the future, we need to be able to ask the critical questions. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anybody, you know, I, I, I risk my life probably every day just trying to help people. I mean, you know, I do that on a mega level, you know, and, and I do accept the karma of that. And I do accept the trolling and all that that comes with doing that to try to help people and get another perspective in front of people. And I am concerned that what you're saying is true, that it's becoming any kind of questioning is becoming vilified. Well, if we can't question, how are we going to get to the bottom of it and prevent it? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost set up as if the bottom is whatever we tell you on the evening news. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's it. That's the truth. And if you question it, you're, you know, you, you, know, you're you hate person. kids or something. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah. actually, we love kids and we want to yeah. prevent this from happening to kids in the future. And we need to know all the facts or at least as best we can understand it. So maybe there's something in there that is preventable. Do you ever, are you ever concerned for your own personal safety? Not really. I mean, really. as a lot of I mean, you know, holistic doctors tend to yeah. disappear mysteriously and, and this kind of stuff. I'm a very random person. I'm very difficult to track, um, as you know. Yeah. You know, I don't, yeah. you know, I'm just, I'm a very random person. Yeah. And um, I, I, when I was a kid, you know, we read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Douglas right. Adams. I remember when you turned, point. what was the number in that, 44? 42. Or 42, yeah. I remember when you turned 42 and you were talking about that because I was 42 also. I read the entire series that year when I was 42. All the books, that were what an amazing cadre of books. And I'm, by the way, a big fan of reading. And um, one of the key ideas in that first book was the idea of randomness. And when I was very young, 13, 14, I was like, okay, I do the random thing. That's who I am. I, I took that into my being as very random. And so uh, for that reason, I like to be unpredictable. 
you know, and, and I think that makes me very difficult target for the system, you know, if in fact the system is targeting me. I think they are targeting me on social media, there's no question about it. Yeah. There's enough fake accounts hitting me that I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that, that I'm, I trip out on. I was like, how could someone care that much to take the time to like build a web page or a Facebook page that's a fake David Wolf or an attack David Wolf? I'm like, like, okay, I get if some people are really, as you said, in a lot of emotional pain and they just, hey, I'll pick that guy because yeah. he triggers me for whatever reason. It's the but same it's, thing as like, But it's know. beyond that, dude. I mean, it's like, there's some, there's some real energy that is moving towards suppressing uh, a voice like yours. So... So, and, and, you know, you know maybe, I, I maybe would be a little bit worried walking around. It, I know? kind of, I can, it, that probably protects me a little bit, you know, as a, as a person because they, you know, they, we've debunked David Wolf, so, you know, you, now you don't have to listen to him and, and they believe that and probably some other people believe that so that keeps enough people off of me believing what anything I'm saying or even looking at what I'm saying or anything. So it's probably saving my ass right now, actually. The troll, you right. know, if I really look at it, the, the debunking is kind of a relief a little bit because it gets enough people, you know, off of my case. Right. You know right. what I mean? Do you it's see, like, you see the yeah, it's like when, a, when a, uh, you know, a uh, watchdog is barking in your face and you throw a stake over in the other direction, you yeah. know, kind of distracts them. Oh, okay, we're over here now, you know. And it, it, I've got so much traffic, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'll show you, when, you know, we get off this call, I have to actually get my computer up because I forgot my phone. Um, randomly and um, I get so much traffic on the internet it is not even funny I mean it's too much so if they want to debunk me they debunk me for 500 years who cares I, I've, I've got more traffic you can ever debunk right yeah I was looking at your Facebook I think last time we spoke I checked it out because I you know any guest I'm studying up on them and I think you were at like 7 million Facebook followers and I looked again it was at 12 it's like a year later that's insane it's insane dude. And, and it's yeah. because people want to know and, and we give them, you know, all those stages, you know, I love the beginning group and I love the intermediate group and I love the advanced group. I love all aspects of what I do. I love educating people and the basics of health, you know, hey, here's a salad, here's how you grow your own food, here's how you grow tomato, you know, I love all that stuff just as equally as I love Shazandra and Pearl and Long and beauty recipes. Right. You know, just, right. I just love it all. So meeting people kind of at their entry level. Yeah, and, and, um, that, and I love just providing media that hits every level. It's just incredible. It's in terms so of kind of getting the powers that be, you know, off of focusing on you, I've observed some people that are even way more fringe than you, like take a David Icke, for example. And that guy, you know, when I discovered him maybe probably 15 years ago, I mean, he was putting out such deep information on the way things work, just with the royal bloodlines and how the bushes are related to the royal families and this and that. I mean, it's just... It was mind blowing in the Knights Templar and the Masons and just the world domination of the banks and a lot of things that we've touched on. And I'm, I was watching, I'd be watching his DVDs going, how are, why are they not taking this guy out? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't believe that, you know, the Rockefellers or whomever, you know, at the top of the Illuminati pyramid have not taken this dude out. And I'm like, why? And then he goes into the reptilian alien stuff, you know, and I, I've always thought that because he kind of crossed that line of total weirdness, that it they, saved him. Yeah, that they kind of leave him alone. Yeah. They're like, ah, who's going to believe the rest of the stuff he says? Because when you get to the reptilian face shifting, whatever, you know, in the White House, they're all reptilians vibes. That's just too much for even the fringe dwellers in most cases. So the powers that be that he's exposing in so many ways that are truthful and meaningful kind of just leave him alone. I mean, do you feel like it's a similar kind of thing. It's a similar thing. A lot of the yeah. stuff you say is so out there. They're just kind of like, all right, yeah, whatever. We're just gonna leave him over there doing his thing with the hippies. Yeah, <laughs> totally. kind of like that. Yeah. It's kind of like that, and and good, you know, yeah. whatever. I, it's just what you know. What can I do about it? I keep putting the message out there, and it keeps growing, and you know, more and more people like it, and I keep, you know, getting incredible people coming at me who are, you know, the stories like the like yesterday, I was with a gal who worked for NBC News. And, you know, big, big mega station, big media. And she kept watching the videos that we were putting out on Facebook of the, um, what happens when you give an, an epileptic child CBD. We put that out there every week. We put that out there right in people's face so that people could see all the vilification of the cannabis plant, all the hate, all the drug wars, all the insanity of the governments fighting that plant. And what does it come back with? P 
pure love. Here, CBD, save your kids from epilepsy, save your kids from autism, bring your kids back from the brink. I mean, that's love right there. I mean, you talk about a plant that can meet your needs. And we put that story out there and it got to her. And guess what? She broke that story on major news networks and it transformed the whole conversation across this whole country so that now everybody knows about medical marijuana. Wow. Do you see how wow. powerful that is? Yeah. So I will keep going. I will. I will. No, I don't care if one person likes my stuff or a million or doesn't. <laughs> right. I don't. It doesn't matter. I mean, who cares? Right. That's, see, that's the cosmic knight in me. I'm, I've always, from the time I played Dungeons and Dragons as a kid, I was always the ranger. I was the. I was the knight, you know. And and it was like I don't. I don't need followers. I don't, you know. That's a, that's another thing. You know that thing of like, if you don't care, then it's just they come, right? I don't right. care about followers. I don't, you know, who cares about that kind of stuff? Right. Um, I can get enough. I can put a little quiz out there and, and you know, go, hey, do you want this training? And I'll get a hundred emails, and I'll just go right to those hundred emails out of a million or ten million people. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, that's well, that's cool. I'm glad you've you've persevered through all of these years putting stuff out because you can imagine the lives you've touched. I mean, me just being out for a year and a half, I get messages literally every day. I learned this from you, I learned that from you. The guests that you bring on, the way that you present it has changed my life. I got this device, that device, this supplement, doing this detox, practicing this meditation. It's just like endless, endless accolades and gratitude and good energy really coming from people. So, you know, yeah, do you, do you need 20 billion people doing that? Not really. Not couple, really. A couple no. emails a day feels pretty good. Feels it's pretty like, good, yeah. All right, what I'm doing is worthwhile. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, you, you just, you know, you just work and work and work and work and work and then, you know, you just hope, too. You know, that sometimes just being in the state of hope is even better hey, than the look result. At, look at my shirt. Look dude. at that. High hopes right there. High hopes. Yeah. Sometimes just being in that state of hope is even better than actually any feedback at all. Right, right. Just, it's a vibration. You know, hope is a vibration. Um, I, I was deeply impacted back in the peak performance days with the Tony Robbinses and the Jim Rohns about... I'm not going to be, I'm not trying to achieve something to be happy later. It's right now. I'm not trying to get like, okay, uh, my name is Elmer Fudd. I own a mansion and a yacht. Who cares? You know, it's like, we want to be happy right now. We want to be happy in what we're achieving. We want to be in a state of hope as we're putting out media that's about hope. Right. That's, that's very, that's very much how I am. Right. So... I feel like we could go down this uh, this <laughs> venture forever, but uh, we are at a little bit of limited time, and I want to I want to talk about your book, dude. All right. I just got I just got the advance in the mail yesterday, and usually, honestly, I get like a week or two to mull it over, but I did a speed dive into it, and it's it's really really comprehensive and cool, and there are some things in there that are kind of part of my repertoire and my lifestyle, but there were a lot of new things too that I haven't even heard you talk about, so. Uh, what's the the basis of your book? The the book that I've written years ago on beauty was is now twenty years old, and in that process, I've learned so much about the Ayurvedic approach to beauty, Taoist tonic herbalism, the importance of hormones as anti aging, the power of superfoods, the power of super herbs and tonic herbs to keep us young and have energy and vitality and a, you know, be in a state of abundance. This is such an important piece of the overall puzzle of what the Native Americans called the beauty way. It's, it's a way of life. It's like you see beauty, you optimize towards beauty, your life becomes a, a, about a work of art that's always beautiful. And you know, for me, like my life, I'm a gardener, I'm a farmer, and so I'm always, that's just po beauty. I cultivate beauty. I nourish beauty. It's just a, it's a, the beauty way, as the Native American said. So I wanted to get all of that into a book. And um, thank God for Rebecca. Rebecca and I have been doing the longevity conferences for all these years. And she's like, I can, I can help organize this for you. Because I had so many lectures. We basically took my lectures. Right. And we put them, boom, piece by piece by piece. So, for example, the section in charcoal here is... Lectures, detoxification, detoxification pathways, lectures, and then, then we get it down, then we mull through it. Her, she'd go through it, I'd go through it, Lucian go through it, we go back and forth through it, and then she'd go, okay, we need this support there. We'll put that, you know, reference in there. Put this book right here. And she's, you know, big reader. She's ordering stuff off of Amazon every week. I mean, every time I'm over at their house, it's new books arriving. We went through every book in the beauty field 
there is no, as you know, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. you looked at a lot of, that's out there, but yeah. there's nothing like this book. Yeah. The raw foods are in there. The paleo ideas are in there. The ketogenic ideas are in there. The herbal ideas are in there. It's all there. At any page, this is a very important goal for this book. You, you know, like this page, right? Steve Martin and the Jerk, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. that. You can just open it up anywhere and then boom, you can get something in one sentence. That's how I wanted this book to be. And I think we achieved it. I finally got the book into hand, by the way. So when I got here to Luke's place, he got an actual galley copy before I ever even got one. I've only seen this book digitally. And I gotta tell you, just dealing with looking at it on a screen after a while gets old. So I'm so happy to see it in That's this cool. form. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah, I mean, there were so many things in there that I identified with and, and also uh, w wanted to touch on. And one of them was the grounding and earthing technology and just the importance of that and that's something you were talking about you know I don't know 15 years ago I probably heard you talk about that and I have you know a grounding sheet and grounding pads all over the house I take them on the airplane hotels but then I've also talked to a lot of EMF experts that say like you know if you're working at your computer for example and you have a grounding pad on the floor that now the EMFs coming off of your computer are using you as a conduit and they're finding the ground through you and now you're actually attracting more magnetic fields in that case, and you'd be better off not grounding. So, and then there's the whole school of thought, well, if you're using a grounding sheet that has these silver threads in it, you have a giant antenna in your bed and you're picking up all the Wi-Fi and cell. So I intuitively just stay grounded all the time still, but have you discovered anything else about it recently I've, on either side? I've talked to Clint, you know, Clint is the guy who drove this in, Clint Ober, and he, yeah. you know, written the books and pushed the studies to, to happen at all these universities. and. I think he's been behind you know 13 different studies on the subject basically what we were taught in the way that a lot of engineers and a lot of physicists are still taught is that the the earth is like a sink for electromagnetic energy and clint very early on corrected me he's like no it's a push the electromagnetic energy the negative charge of the earth pushes out of the earth and into you so instead of this idea of like oh i'm, I'm on a computer and if i ground myself it's going to go through me into the earth that's impossible Oh. And the negative charge comes out of you and pushes the EMF off of you. Now that's measurable with a voltmeter. That's I remember seeing a video you did with that. And that's I was sold because you see, you know, you see the EMFs coming off the lamp or your laptop. It's like I was like that can't be good. And then you touch the grounding pad and it goes down to zero, like negligible amount of EMF. It's really interesting. It, so I do I do an inner circle group, like my my core group, a couple hundred people. And one of the things that we did was we did that on our last call is I actually got my, I just happened to have it right there. And I was like, let me just show everybody this. So I, I got my voltmeter out and I showed everyone that like, if I get close to my computer, even if I'm not touching it, I'm getting hit by 11 or 12 volts, right? That can't be good. It's like, you know, a thousand years ago, it was zero volts, right? right? There was no electromagnetic fields. Right. And you know, the further you are away, it decreases by the square of the distance. So if I'm just sitting away from it, it's two volts. As soon as I touch that ground, it decreases by 200 times. The electromagnetic field is 200 times less it's actually hitting me. Now, I've been doing this for so long, for so many years. It's an instinct now, right? I know what it's like to be grounded, what it's like not to be grounded. Back and forth and back and forth. And I'd way rather be grounded. I'd rather be grounded in my car. I have a little mister yeah, that drives. I, I copied that. You got I have that. it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the whole thing. I take it to my, every time I get a new car every five years or whatever, I take it to my mechanic. They're like, here he goes again. These dudes, you know, they're, they've never seen anyone like me. But <laughs> right. I, I have like them, I have them test crazy. the ground. They ground it to the battery. I have mm -hmm. a little uh, wrist strap that I had them ground to the frame of the car, you know, a metal wrist strap, a, a wrist strap for me and then the passenger. And they look at me like I'm nuts, but I explained exactly what I wanted. They go, it's grounded, dude. I mean, you're grounded to the car, and when you're on concrete or dirt or a wet surface, then that little cable coming down underneath. But uh, on the grounding the car, because it's people love this, this full geek level, Dude, do you get people all the time going, hey, you got something hanging from your car? Like, that happens you, to me constantly. It's all the time. Like, you, you, you blew a cable, something's hanging from yeah. your car. It's like, dude, no, 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 it's cool. It's no problem. They're like, no, 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 you got like a thing. I'm like, dude, it's good. You can't even it's so explain funny. it to it's people. It's the funniest thing I've ever. At first, I was like, oh, no, I'm grounding the car. You know, I'm like, oh, okay, this is not going to work. So you're still, you're still a proponent and, and you're behind the grounding and earthing thing still. Absolutely into it. It's, it's, it's a prerogative. Another thing that's important and something to think about, and another thing I learned from grounding is, if you can, when you're on a device, make sure it's unplugged. 
beyond yeah. the battery. Yeah. You, you, the amount of EMF hitting you is could be a hundred times less, and then when you ground, it's a hundred times less than that. So to have that device plugged in, very dangerous. With your whether it's your phone or your your tablet or your computer, just unplug it and work off the battery. I yeah. see I, our editor back there is like, wait a second, pulled, he pulled the battery, he pulled his battery right off of there. He's guilty right now. Yeah, no, sometimes you, it, it, it loses its charge and you have to do that. But yeah, I practice that too. And then where are you at with, uh, you know, in addition to the EMF and the grounding issue, where are you at with blue light and all of that? I haven't really heard you talk about that because it's sort of emerged since I think I saw one of your presentations last. Well, we now know the harmful and dangerous uh, aspects of blue light on our eyes. And so I use flux on my computer, right. f.lux, and then I also use the all the devices that come with your operating systems on your iPhones these days that can lower the, the, first of all, lower the light so it's not so bright in your eyes, and then to pull the blue light out. Now that, that does create a problem when you're working what I do, because I have to do a lot of artistic stuff, and I'm pulling the blue light out all the time, so I don't really get a true picture. So I have to send it to yeah. other people on my team, like, can you look at this and make sure this looks okay? Because I don't look at it as a real image. Yeah. I'm always pulling it the blue really light out. It can really ruin your Instagram feed. I've noticed that. Yeah. 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 Where you're just you're looking at, it and then other people are looking on their phone and like, this looks terrible. Do you know what's funny? I don't really post at night on Instagram for that reason because the colors are going to be jacked up and all skewed. All right. So we're killing the blue light. We're still into the grounding. Um, anything else that you want to point to in the book before we wrap it up? We did a nice little section on infrared in here, um, oh. infrared heat and the hot cold therapy. Right. Um, I, I did a lot of stuff in here. There's the grounding earth thing there so that that is covered he heavily in this book. We, it, there's a lot on um, inflammation in this book, how to battle inflammation, what we've learned about it. There's a lot in this book on just overall health principles. For example, the medicinal mushrooms feature in here, especially shaga and reishi. And I, you know, like this whole flu season that goes on, I, I, I think you're probably like me. I didn't get a cold cough, flu fever. I never get anything like that ever. doesn't matter how bad it is, whatever. I'm, I was in a house for two and a half weeks with two 23-year-olds from Australia who'd never seen snow before. They came up to my, my cabin up in uh, Ontario, Canada, and so we're like in that can in that thing together. They're hacking stuff up. They're detoxifying. All this crap's coming out. I didn't get a cough, cold, flu, fever, anything, because I have good immunity based on the herbalism and that knowledge. So, in, as you know, the medicinal mushrooms are the key to that. So shaga and reishi. We go so berserk on shaga and reishi here. It's not even funny. As well as the great Chinese herbs like shizandra and astragalus and all those cool things that, you know, I like to do the eight immortals. I did the eight immortals right before coming on your show, actually. All those, you know, the, the gynostema yeah. and ginseng. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that I take on a daily basis and talk about on the show, I learned at your lectures, dude. All of those things. I have chaga tea in the refrigerator right now. I'm brewing that stuff basically on an ongoing basis. You know, it's like all of those things have just kind of been integrated. But, you know, it's funny. I used to be like you and never get sick. And last year I got sick three times. And I just thought, you know what, this is unacceptable. And so I did some functional lab testing. I had, all, I had E. coli. I had parasites. I had, my gut was jacked up. And so my immune power was just being wow. devastated yeah so yeah I, I just got done doing a whole 30-day protocol to like zap all those bugs and stuff but yeah i was used to that for a few years it's really cool when you kind of you know you have you know compassion for the people that are getting sick but you're sort of like wow better them than me and then all of the stuff that people like you do pays off you know and that you don't actually have to lose time of your life if you if i mean we figured it out right it's like we're at a technological breakthrough point and one of, the, one of the ways to really make your life work is that you just don't need to be wasting your time being sick. Yeah. You don't want to be wasting your time with like coughs, cold, flus, fevers, and low energy. We got, we got that sorted out a long time ago. So ju it's just that's that winning team thing. It's like yeah. get on the winning team. You know, all the, you know, that's what I love about you is like, you know, you were in a different field, but you're like, I, I've got to be on the winning team here. I've got to get my act together because I don't want to be dragged down by all these things that are preventable. Yeah, totally. So uh, as we come to a close, we've got the Longevity Now conference coming up, as I said, April 6th, 7th, and 8th. Uh, you're going to be there. Who else is going to? Because this episode will come out uh, in, in, I think, next uh, in two weeks from now. So it'll be but in advance of that. So who are going to be some of the speakers? What can we look forward to over there? Nadine will be back you nice. know, with Living Libation. She's the best ever. We've got Dr. Uh, Gundry, and he's this guy's done like 10,000 open heart surgeries. So he knows 
things, you know, from looking inside human, you imagine how many human bodies he's actually looked in the side of living human bodies. It's, wow. you know, so I'm excited to get his perspective and just, you know, if there's people like that who've learned things from their experience. Um, we've got Dr. Davis coming, another cardiologist, and he's Wheat Belly. You yeah. remember his work on Wheat Belly? Yeah, he's the guy that makes me feel real guilty when I have some sourdough bread or right? something. Right, like yeah. gluten and gliadin. Yeah. You're just like, oh my God, it's a yeah. gluten gliadin nightmare. Yeah. Um, we're, we're not saying, we do not condone that you guys stop eating avocado toast, by the way, just so you know. Uh, okay. That is, that's tough, actually. <laughs> There's a spot in New York, man, that makes the best avocado toast. And there are certain places where I'm willing to take the gluten hit if it's just like, Spot Nece on. Yeah, it's just necessary for the recipe. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, let's see, we've got uh, Jason Rebell will be doing recipes. I'm going to be doing I'm going to be doing a talk there. Ross Solo will be there from Iceland. We've got Danielle Laporte is coming, and she's going to be speaking. We had a great conversation on the phone the other day. And let's John see, Gray. John Gray is there. John Gray, you know, men are from Mar Mars, women are from Venus. I, I did an event with him 10 years ago with uh, T. Harv Eker. Oh, wow. And we just hit it off. Yeah. That guy's amazing. Yeah, he's he's been on the show twice. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you know him. Yeah, John you know, Gray he's is something else. I always thought he was kind of outdated, and you know that book was out when I was a teenager, and I was like, ah, that's lame. You know, I just I totally discounted it, and then I heard him speak at some event and was just floored. And uh, I've been following his work since, and had him on a couple of times. And he is such a cool guy with such an interesting history. All his time spent with the Maharishi, and he was like celibate for nine years. All these trips to India. I mean, his whole pre-relationship teachings are even awesome and he has a really interesting perspective on guruism and things like that having been there at the feet of those guys and uh i've learned a lot and he is something else yeah, he, he he and he's i a, can't wait to hear his his new talk his his knowledge on health and healing is astounding and so i just always love having him at yeah the event. it's just a pleasure because he's he's also got the whole his whole approach is based on hormones you know so there's just it's very uh, realistic. It's not like a theory. It's like, no, this is how the male and female body operate on a chemical level. And if you do X, Y, and Z, these are the results. So it's very pragmatic and um, approachable. Yes. Um, so we'll be doing that. And then I hear that people might be getting a book of yours if they come to the conference or something. That's right. Everybody who comes to the conference gets a copy of the Beauty oh, Diet cool. book. So okay, that's part awesome. of the deal. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we, we've got thousands of copies ready and, and and I'm gonna actually be there I'll be there signing books and I love to do that just to I'll just hunker down and just try to sign as many books as possible so meeting people one-on-one -on -one. the event is in Anaheim it's April 6th 7th and 8th Dan and I'm Hilton right next to Disneyland literally right next to it and it's one of it's like their flagship Hilton yeah it's nice I, I just I go and just stay down there I always just get a room just it's, get a room down yeah, there. yeah. It's, it's just easier you're just in it know. yeah yeah and it's it is funny that it's next to Disneyland, though, because there's all these sort of health-minded, uh, you know, I don't want to say hippies, but, I mean, people are wearing ponchos, such as you, and I don't look like your average uh, middle American, but there's, like, the whole Disneyland tourist crew kind of in the hotel and around the area. That's you, right. You yes, know, there's a real, so there's a juxtaposition culturally of all of those people with their families and then all of us, you know, uh, people that are munching on vanilla beans that you grew yourself and all that stuff, so it's really cool. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you about in the in the event is when I first started going to Longevity Now, the whole scene was like raw vegan and there was definitely no speakers that were talking about paleo or keto or eating meat or high fat or any of this and things sort of evolved and it seemed to me from afar that there is in, in your kind of scene and the uh, conference scene that there's a little bit less rigidity and a polarization in terms of you know the really ardent raw vegan people and then there's this other camp of people that eat meat and I, I brought it up because uh, in your book you also you know give a paleolithic approach and talk about uh, ketosis and things like that so how, how have you seen the scene evolve in terms of everyone being strictly raw vegan and maybe throwing in some animal products here and there and all that that so this brings us back to that Rudolf Steiner thing the aramonic deception which is being too rigid Right, where you're hardened in. It's like, we have to do it exactly this way and that stuff. We don't want that. We've got to loosen up a little bit. And, and so therefore, there's always a place for all these different theories, you know, the vegan strategy, the vegetarian strategy. I'm a vegetarian. I was ve vegan for almost 20 years and vegetarian today. And, you know, that's my personal choice and that's the way I like to live. And I just, I'm not like one of these people who goes, you know, you have to live like I live. I right. am not like that. I got pigeonholed into that for years people are like you tell people they have to eat raw food and it's like no I'm just like here's raw food here's you know what I mean it, I've never been 
a fanatic about that kind of stuff. I just right. love what I love and I love to share it. And so I just wanted to get that more through the event. And, and I think years ago, we really succeeded in doing that, made it very accessible and also but very more accepting of other people's ideas and concepts. Yeah, I was almost surprised when Dave Asprey spoke, you know, and I, I was kind of waiting for that moment. And he was like, and the new superfood is butter. You know, I was like waiting like, for the tomato, you know, the biodynamic tomatoes to start getting flung on stage. And everyone was sort of chill. I was like, oh, wow, this crowd has evolved a little bit. And I think some of the, I mean, I have personal friends, quite a few of whom, you know, were ardent raw vegans. And then after a period, we're like, yeah, I don't feel so good. And they start doing bone broth or ghee or, you know, some of the the more lightweight, less violent animal products and things like right, that, just yeah. according to their body saying, hey, I'm thirsty for this or that. So it's been interesting to kind of watch the evolution. Did you experience any, you know, backlash from the, the diehards when you were like, oh, hey, I have a little ghee here and there. Was there like a lot of freak I think, outs? I think just the, the diehards who know me or who knew me back in the early days, they knew I was not like that kind of, I'm not like, you know, like I'm not marching. I love PETA, I love what they do, but I'm not gonna be, you know, going and, you know, trolling like people wearing fur on the street or whatever, you know what I mean? Right. I'll put the message out there that I feel strong, you know, like, hey, let's, let's use other things other than fur, but I'm not gonna be out there harassing people. And so they kind of knew that about me back in the early days, so they hated me back then. Oh, okay. Because I was a vegan who wasn't like a fanatic. Uh, you weren't like gonna join the revolution on that, yeah. Yeah, and so I have gotten so much flack for not being a fanatic vegan that it was, I don't think it really, you know, I, I had gotten out of that community I see. way back then. Right, right. Um, so yeah it, was, yeah, it wasn't that much of a, of a stretch to be like, hey, you know, look at these ideas and check this out. Right, that's cool, yeah. that's cool. I, going back to our, our uh, guy, David Hawkins, you know, something he said that just, I always say this because it's just such a great, profoundly simple way to state this, is he would say just, and speaking of cacao and vanilla, he'd say just because you like chocolate doesn't mean you have to be against vanilla. You know, and that's like this, I guess in the conversation of being patriotic or pro-American or, you know, being what they call a nationalist or something. Like, I love this country. I also love a lot of other countries. Yeah, you know, so just yeah if nice, I'm like, well said. Yet if I have an American flag, you know, which I don't, but if I wanted to wear an American flag shirt, I mean, I feel like in LA, I might get assassinated by Antifa or something. Because that would mean that I hate Muslims. <laughs> is that, or, you know, who the knows? Fascist, the anti-fascist. Yeah, who are actually fascists, which is so weird. But uh, anyway. But, you know, so just because I am I like a paleo diet or a vegan diet doesn't mean that I have to be against those other people. It's like, Rodney King, man, can't we all just get along? You know, there's there's valuable uh, positions and, and uh, points of view on all sides. So I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to find kind of the middle road there and not alienate too many people that are of sound, reasonable mind. It, totally, absolutely. And I think it's very important to find that you know, that um, ability to, to, to discuss these ideas. You right. know, that's another one of those things that like, when it gets so intense and heated and emotional, we can't even discuss it. Right. And what good is that doing anybody? You know, I think so. that's the, the fun thing about me having the, the format of being a host is I can interview people kind of on, on both sides of the fence that have some pretty strong ideas. And I'm actually just curious, you know, I've got a show coming out, I think in between right now and when yours comes out with a guy, um, uh, Marcus Antebi, who owns the juice press chain in New York City, which I'm so grateful for. And he's an ardent plant-based vegan. And he was on the show and told me a hundred ways that any form of animal products just totally give you cancer and the worst thing ever. And that all raw food and vegetables are the answer to everything. And it was very convincing. And by the end of the conversation, I was like, damn, I need to eat more vegetables. You know? I don't know <laughs> if I'm, I'm ready to give up meat, but it was an interesting perspective. And then I've had, you know, Jack Wolfson, the paleocardiologist on who just like, can convince you for five hours why a vegan diet is going to kill you in five years, you know, and and it's it all seems to have some validity, you know. I think it's just a matter of, as we've said, keeping that open mind and just being willing to take in the nuggets that resonate with you intuitively from the different schools of thought. One of my favorite quotes that you reminded me of is by Nietzsche, and and Nietzsche's Nietzsche said, "A philosophy that does not contain paradox is not a philosophy at all." Oh, that's great. Right? And you, it, because paradox is part of reality. And so if your philosophy doesn't have paradoxical stuff, right, that's a, that's a thing that we see a lot online is like people are like, you said this, but you also said that. How can you believe both of those? It's like, because I do. <laughs> right, right. Or because that was yesterday. Yeah. You know, you get right? accused of this, this concept, this political concept of flip-flopping. And it's like, well, no. I mean, five years ago, this was my truth based on my reality at that given moment. And I may have said this or that or believed this or that. And then hopefully we all evolve and change our opinions over time as we grow. 
Yeah, good. Well, dude, uh, we're at the end of Let's the show. Yeah. Oh my god, we're, we're right on time. We, in fact, I was like, hey, should we do an hour? Well, we had to cut off, and we're right to the minute. And I think it's a good place to uh, to tie a bow on it. So thank you so much, dude. I'm. I'm so, Thank you so much. happy to see you and have you in my home. And, uh, and, and also, thanks for having us over. We yeah, really appreciate dude, it. of course. And it's just, I'm so glad we're able to do this in person because the first one we did was on Skype. And I always talk to the audience about how challenging those are because I get spoiled living in LA. Like most of my good interviews are either in LA or New York. And I get to do them in person and there's just so much more warmth and rapport. So I'm glad you weren't in Hawaii and I was able to catch you while you're out here. And uh, I think that's it, man. Oh, right no, on. it's not. Oh, my God. This would have been the first time I ever forgot this question. Real quick, last question is, who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you might send our listeners to go check out? Okay, fantastic. Well, we talked about Rudolf Steiner, so I'll skip that one. Right. But you mentioned Victor Schauberger. And I think right. Victor Schauberger, pull up on YouTube, Victor Schauberger's Water Research, The Water Wizard, and learn a little bit about what he had to say about the way that we move water around and how we could do it better. And, right. and, and how we could create devices and machines and all different kinds of plowing and all kinds of things of growing food in a better way by understanding how water moves. So that's number one. Next um, week, dude, I've got a trifecta. I'm just going to interject this because, well, people will have already heard it, but I'm just going to tell you because I'm so excited. There was, you, you, I don't know, you probably saw this conspiracy against spring water. Thousands of yes, web articles against that, yes. our, our guy Makunde that does live spring water, Seth yep. with Tourmaline Springs in New York. All these like little guys are just being attacked and you know and and put in these. Uh, they're being like tricked into going on these TV shows and all this misinformation, like anti-natural water propaganda. And I was like, this will not stand. I'm like, this is one thing you can't fuck with. Like seriously. So I need to get something out. So I interviewed uh, Daniel Vitalis and Makunde and Seth. And next week I'm putting out a, a triple episode. Uh, it's five hours of content. All about water. Yes. Yeah, I'm really excited. So Good job. I did three hours with Daniel, then an hour with each of the other guys, because they each own a, a, an untreated raw spring water company on each coast. And I think we, we literally covered like every damn thing there is to talk about with water. So I'm really excited. And, That's... You know, and i got to give you uh, credit for that, too, because you were one of the first guys along with Daniel to really talk about spring water and reminded me. Yeah, when I was a little kid, I used to go correct, collect spring water in uh, Colorado with my grandmother. That's awesome. It was just like, that's what you do when you're four or five. Oh, we're going up to the hill to get some water. And then all those years, I forgot about it. Now it's a big part of my life. So uh, thank you for that. So Victor Schauberger, and then who's next? Okay, so Victor Schauberger. Let's see. who. What's another one? Um, I'm a big fan of Charles Fort. Um, Charles Fort is really the developer, the major in the, in the 20th century, the major developer of paranormal literature. Um, and Charles Fort was a major inspiration to Stephen King. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. And, and he wrote four books, The Book of the Damned, Low, Wild Talents, and New Lands. Groundbreaking stuff. A big, voluminous tome and just rich. I've heard with, you talk about stuff. him before, and I'm not yet familiar. So, yeah, Charles Fort, cool. just at least get... It's a little, you know, because it's written back in the 1920s and 30s, so a little language is a little different. It's very sarcastic, yeah. extremely sarcastic, yeah. but fun. Once you crack into the style, it's just... It reads almost like a comic book. It's just That's entertaining. Cool. I yeah. like that era, though, that New Thought movement. You know, Napoleon Hill and William James and uh, who was the other one? Oh, Emmett Fox. Like yes. That, like, Christian science sort of teachings from back then. They kind of broke off from a lot of the traditional ideas. And I think I that language is all kind of the same during that era, you know? But I like that. I don't know for some reason. I think because... Uh, a lot of the 12-step literature is from around the same time in the 30s, and it, it has the same vernacular and sort of the same tone. So that's cool stuff. I'm probably going to give a little plug to Bruce Lipton on this one, too, because nice. I'm such a fan of Bruce, and we're such good friends, and I love his... I love, you know, when I was younger and I was reading a lot of books on genetics, and I eventually got to the epigenetic work of Lamarck, and I was, I was always a Lamarck, Lamarckian. You know, I was into Lamarckism. And it was vilified and hated and the system was against it. But then 40 years now of epigenetics has, has now vindicated Lamarck. And I love the way that Bruce Lipton tells that story That's in his cool. books. So if you can read a couple of Bruce Lipton books and get the story of the great geneticist Lamarck. Cool. Who really epigeneticists. So that's, those are my three. Awesome. That's yeah. perfect, dude. And then where can people find you on social media, websites, etc.? Okay, David Avocado Wolf. So you can see the avocado. I am the avocado man. 40 years growing avocados. David Avocado Wolf on Facebook. David Avocado Wolf on Instagram. 
David Wolf on Twitter. Twitter's an abomination. You don't want to go there. I just that's like exper- <laughs> I that's like an experiment. Um, totally. What else? Uh, probably my f- other favorite social media. YouTube. Cool. David Avocado Wolf. Okay. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much, dude. Good to see you. And we got to take a we got a half an hour break, and then I'm going to be um, gratefully on your Facebook show. So. We're, we're putting him on the show, so we're going to flip flip the script here. That's I love been the it. Theme of the year. Thanks for were, joining us, everybody. Because there was talk of it, and then we're like, oh no, it's not going to happen. And then you arrive, you're like, guess what? I'm like, oh man, I got to get my head together. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll cut out. Thanks again for coming, dude. Yeah. Fantastic. It.